Hello everyone, Xeno What If here. Bring in Season 2 Part 8 of What If the Transformers Were in My Hero Academia. Link in the description of the fanfiction of this What If. A. N. Listen here YouTube. I do not own anything and this is not a scam. Chapter 15. The Con Job. Comma dot dot. Izuku was going through absolute hell. Well, okay, that was a bit of an exaggeration, but he was definitely not feeling all that pleasant. His adrenaline and blood were pumping a mile a minute, his heart rate only just barely able to keep up as he zoomed around the large, open field where Strongarm and Tenya usually trained. He had a feeling that one for all was responsible for helping his body keep up with how much he was exerting, all while he zipped around the field with newfound freedom as a bright green light and sparks trailed behind him. And in all honesty, while he felt really tingly while using this new ability, he also felt a lot more secure. He had no soreness in his muscles, his movement wasn't hindered in the least, and most importantly of all, he wasn't breaking any bones. It was like a huge weight had been lifted off his shoulders and his mind. Yes, yes, I can finally use one for all, slam. A-A-C-K. The wind was immediately knocked out of him when he felt a 15% blow directly hit his abdomen, and he was sent flying backward until his body collided with the ground. Oh, right, I'm sparing with all might. Damn it, don't get distracted. As Izuku coughed and hacked up his lunch, All Might stood across from him with his hands on his hips, waiting for his student to catch his breath. Not too far away, Optimus and Bumblebee were observing the duo in robot mode, the two Autobots intent on seeing just what this new power of Izuku's could do. Come now, young Midoriya. All Might encouraged, don't tell me that one punch is enough to take you out. And I wasn't even putting my all into that. Izuku regained his bearings and balled up his fists, bringing one for all back to the forefront. No way. I I was just getting warmed up. Ah ha ha. Were you now? All Might clenched his own fists and bent his knees, ready to get back at it. Well, if that's the case, then let's see what this new ability has in store. And just like that, the two one for all wielders were off like a shot, both of them zipping around the vast field almost too fast to see. Thankfully, Optimus and B were able to keep a lock on them thanks to their optics, and the more they watched, the more impressed they were. I must say, one for all is quite the power to have. Optimus pondered to himself, and the way Izuku is using it seems to be quite a bit different than how All Might does. ZRKT, they've got, ZRKT, the touch. Bumblebee noted, ZRKT, they've got, ZRKT, the power. Yeah. HMHM, yes, that they do. Optimus chuckled as he continued watching the fight. However, it seems quite clear that even at 15%, All Might still has the overwhelming advantage. Across the expansive field, All Might was currently hammering away at Izuku's defenses, the boy keeping his arms crossed in front of him as the number one hero pummeled him with his fists. And it was very apparent that Izuku was starting to succumb to the pain, his limbs shaking as he was pushed back along the ground with his heels trailing in the dirt. Come on, young Midoriya. All Might goaded. Is this all that your new ability can do? Izuku grit his teeth and felt his adrenaline begin to spike again. No, this isn't all it could do. Izuku pumped his legs and leapt back a fair distance away from All Might, only to then lurch forward and jump right back into the thick of it. He reared one of his fists back as he flew through the air, all while yelling, S-M-A-A-A-A-S-H. Ha, huh, I thought so. All Might reared back his own fist and called out his own attack, Rhode Island, S-M-A-A-A-A-A-S-H. The two met in the middle and their fists collided, and from the impact alone, a small wave of wind gusts were kicked up and sent ripping through the whole area. While Prime and B weren't affected, the tall grass around them was blown straight down, leaving a sort of crop circle in the epicenter of their punch. And that's when Izuku went in for his chance. Haya! With another pump of his legs, Izuku swung himself down from All Might's arm and aimed a kick for his midsection, making sure to aim for the right side instead of the left. And, much to his surprise, thwack. He landed his kick. Oof. All Might doubled back at the surprise blow, truly not expecting such a maneuver. Impressive, his main smash was just a distraction to leave me open for a different attack. Young Midoriya, if this was a real fight, I probably would have been more careful of that area, but you took advantage of the situation quite well. Gah. Izuku dropped down, keeping his right arm close to his side. 
He could already feel some numbness beginning to spread down his forearm. Man, even at just 15%, he's way more than what I'm capable of handling, he craned his head up to his mentor, who was still smiling down at him. Crap, now what? However, much to his surprise, All Might relaxed his stance and raised a hand. That should be enough for the moment. Let's take a break. Izuku's eyes widened and his eyes became the size of peas. Optimus and Bumblebee were similarly shocked as well. B but, we only just got started. Ahem, yes, well, hawk hawk. All Might coughed some blood into his hands as his body erupted into a puff of smoke, reverting back into his skinnier form. Even the big guns need a break at times. Toshinori sighed and fell onto his rear, resting his arms on his legs. Having to keep up appearances at school today didn't help matters either, after all. Oh, right, Izuku said in disappointment. But hey, don't worry. After a few minutes, I'll be ready to go again. Toshinori assured. After all, only using 15% of one for all isn't as excruciating as using all of it at once. Speaking of, great work back there. Seems this new ability is really working for ya. Izuku sat down next to his mentor and smiled to him. Yeah, s so far, so good, right. However, a feeling of uncertainty began to bubble up inside him as he shifted his gaze toward the ground. Although, I do still have a long way to go. Even with this new way of using one for all, I can still only use 5%. But then, Toshinori reached over and placed a hand on his shoulder. And that's absolutely fine. Just because you've found a safe way of using one for all, it doesn't mean that you suddenly have to start using it all at once. Izuku brought his head back up as Toshinori went on, think of how you threw the ball on your first day in school. Back then, you only used a small portion of your body to use 100% of one for all's power. But here, it's the reverse, and that means you're only gonna be able to harness more and more as you get used to doing this. The Autobots came over and Prime spoke up as well. He's right, Izuku, there is absolutely no rush in harnessing your power. Optimus knelt down in front of the two humans, giving Izuku a supportive nod. And believe me when I say that you may be surprised in how well you'll be able to do so. We all have faith in you, young man. ZRKT, ya gotta believe, ZRKT, in yourself. Bumblebee encouraged. Slowly but surely, Izuku's grin returned, and he let out a small sigh. Ha, huh, thanks guys. That, that makes me feel a little better about it, I can say that much. Toshinori gave him a thumbs up. Great to hear, but of course, we've still yet to get to the important part. Hmm, W what's that, All Might? Your new technique, what do you wanna call it? All Might asked, raising a finger to make his point. After all, a good hero always has names for their abilities, even if they don't say them out loud. Izuku hummed to himself and placed a hand to his chin. Well, now that you mention it, I did have an idea, he gestured to himself with both hands, running them from the top of his head to the lower parts of his body. Why you know how this new technique I came up with basically covers my whole body? Well, I was thinking, I it's almost like a cowl, ya know. Ah, Yes, like the ones a lot of American heroes like to wear. All Might nodded. The greenette pointed to his teacher as his voice became more excited. Yes, exactly. So I was thinking, that since this, cowl, covers my whole body, I was thinking something along the lines of, full cowling. Bumblebee was quick to sound his opinion. ZRKT, that sounds, ZRKT, totally badical. And Optimus agreed wholeheartedly. I am uncertain what this, badical, word means, but I can only assume it's positive. I think that, full cowling, is a perfect name for this new ability, Izuku. Hey, what they said. Toshinori chuckled before ruffling his protege's hair. Not bad at all, young Midoriya. He gave Izuku a wink. Just remember, don't go shouting, one for all, full cowling, or anything. Oh, you definitely won't have to worry about that, all might. Izuku reassured, I made a promise and I intend on keeping it, a at least until I know I can trust the others with this secret. The number one hero glanced up toward Optimus, recalling that conversation they had about a week or so back. Hmm, yes, of course. With a stretch of his arms and legs, Toshinori got back up to his feet, ready to get back to it. Gia, alright, break time's over. Pomf, let's get back at it.
Izuku kicked back up as well and charged full cowling back up. Right, let's go. As he and All Might took their positions, though, a stray thought occurred to him. Hmm, wonder how the others are doing with Springer. Comma dot dot. Heads up. Bulkhead called out as he tossed the cube across the beach, flinging it right toward Springer. Haha, <laughs> nice lob. Springer raised his hands to catch the cube, but that wouldn't end up happening. With a quick leap in the air, Momo vaulted herself in front of him using a metal rod she created from her hand, and caught the cube while doing a frontward flip. She landing on her feet with great ease and chuckled at her catch. Ha! Huh. Not bad, boys, but not good enough. Sideswipe, go long. Momo tossed the energy cube over to the red Lambo twin, who kept his arms raised high to catch it. All right, I've got it, I, shoom. Without warning, Tenya suddenly rushed into the scene and vaulted up, delivering a strong, engine-fueled kick toward the cube and knocking it away from sideswipe. Don't got it. Strongarm, it's coming to you. Tenya exclaimed to his guardian. The cadet successfully caught it with a victorious laugh. Ha ha. Excellent interception, Tenya. Hey, come on, that was my catch. Sideswipe bemoaned. With a satisfied smirk, Strongarm began spinning the cube on her fingertip. You snooze, you lose, punk. She rolled it across her shoulders before tossing it to one of her teammates. Kyoka, take it. The earphone jack user was quick on the draw, extending her jacks toward the cube as it came her way. She wrapped her jacks around it securely before giving it a strong tug, sending it flying in a different direction. Jazz, get the goal. Jazz, who was at one of the far ends of the beach, held his arms up, ready to make the catch. Gotcha, Kyo. Let's win this, clang. Gah, hey. You snooze, you lose. Sunstreaker taunted after tripping up the lieutenant, catching the cube in the process. And just like that, he was off again. Sorry, but I've got places to be. But unfortunately for Sunstreaker, he quickly found himself being flanked on either side by Bulkhead, Springer and Strongarm, and so he knew he had to pass it off to someone. Denki, think fast. Huh, what was the, twonk? The electric blonde wasn't paying attention, however, and the cube rebounded off his head and went flying off further down the court. O.W. Hey, give a guy a little warning, huh? I did. Sunstreaker argued as the three other bots ran past them. You were just staring off into space. Further down the beach, Ochako and Ajiro both stood with their hands up, ready to catch the cube. We got it guys, don't worry. The redhead assured. It's in the bag, huh? Ochako was cut off when suddenly, Mina came rushing in from out of nowhere, sliding along the sand before jumping up and catching the cube from out of midair. The pink girl was without her footwear and was secreting acid from her feet, giving herself a fair bit of added maneuverability as she slipped and slid across the sand on her acid trail. Hey! Sorry, Chaco. Mina beamed as she rushed past the others, headed back over to their own goal. Before she knew it, though, Sideswipe and Sunstreaker were on either side of her, though that didn't last long as Springer and Bulkhead tackled the two to the ground. A-H. No. My paint. Sunstreaker shrieked. Springer pumped a fist and shouted, Go for it, kid. Give us the win, Mina. Bulkhead supported as well. Though she had to maneuver herself past a few other bots and her own classmates, Mina finally found herself at the goal, where Windblade was waiting for her as the goalie. The city speaker grinned eagerly and widened her stance, extending her wings for intimidation factor. You really think you can get past M.E., Mina? No, but she can. Mina tossed the cube up in the air and Strongarm caught it, the cadet practically plowing her way into the surprised Windblade to score the goal. Ha ha. Yes. Victory. Strongarm held the cube aloft as it suddenly flashed in her hand, resulting in her whole body shining in the same light briefly. Across the beach, R.C. sighed as she stepped away from her own goal position. Well, guess that's that. She and the others regrouped and she smiled down to the pink girl. Nice work there, Mina. I think it's safe to say that you're the MVP of this game. Mina gave her a wink and a thumbs up. Thanks. I can't believe how fun running around with a giant energy cube is. To think that something so simple can be so invigorating at the same time. Tenya commented as well. Springer chuckled from behind, moving up to Strongarm to procure the cube from her. Hee hee, if you think that's crazy, you should see it when it's really in action. 
He tapped the side of the cube as he explained. See, we only just played one form of how cube can be played. Another way we could do it is if we activated the AI in this bad boy so it could actually try to get away from us while trying to score a goal. Ooh, can we do that next then? Mina asked as she bounced up and down excitedly. EH, why don't we take a little break for a while, Mina? Bulkhead asked as he reached around toward his backside. We've been at it for an hour and a half now and I'm starting to get sand in my articulators. He reached up and pat Springer on the shoulder. Besides, I wanna get around to telling you guys some of our old reckon stories, ain't that right, Springs? Hey, yeah, sure Bulk. Springer nodded. Sounds good to me. Let's head back. As they started back, though, Sideswipe was quick to take note of something. By the way, Springer, I couldn't help but notice those two, things on your shoulders. He pointed to the blue and red pods that were clamped over his wheels, which got everyone focused in on them as well. Hey yeah, what exactly are those, anyway? Ochako asked. They don't really seem to fit your aesthetic. Oh, well, in his mind, Makeshift was kind of at a loss himself. He had only copied these structures because he saw that Springer had them on. He wasn't too sure what they were, so he decided to do what he did best, fib. They're just storage containers for extra equipment. Designed him myself, actually. Windblade tilted her head to the side. Really? And why the contrasting colors? Hey, gotta make sure I can tell him apart. The wrecker explained. One contains ammo and explosives, the other a patch kit. Don't wanna mistake one for the other, otherwise that'd be a disaster. Bulkhead couldn't help but laugh at that. Bah ha, learned that lesson from Whirl on KEPLER7, didn't ya? Poor bot almost lost both his legs that day after making that mistake. Uh, hey, yeah, glad he survived that one. After a short trek, the group made it back to the warehouse, and the moment they entered the control room, they were met with Red Alert and May still tinkering away at the ground bridge. Still messing around with that thing, Doc. Red Alert perked his head up at that. Ah, so you're back. Yes, we are, but we're making progress, so that's a good thing. We're at about 45% right now with the ground bridge defrag. May noted. Another hour or so and this baby should be back up and running. Springer nodded in approval. Good to know. But I actually did forget to ask, how the heck did it even get like this, anyway? In response, Bulkhead groaned and rolled his optics, along with every other bot and human in the room. Why do I get the feeling this ain't a good story? May grimaced and went back to her work. Because it's not. Those fragging scraplets nearly ate us out of house and home. Springer's optics widened in alarm, but on the inside, Makeshift had to remind himself to stay cool. Wait, scraplets. On this planet, you're serious. Yeah, it was just one big sucky situation. Jazz shook his head. Those lil, buggers nearly had all of us foe, lunch. He jabbed his thumb over toward the ground bridge. Thankfully we got this thing back up and running so we could send him back where they came from, but let me tell ya, it was not a good experience. I see, and you're certain there's none left in the base. Bulkhead raised his metal brow at that. Ah, uh, yes yeah, Springs, we've checked pretty much every nook and cranny round here and didn't find any stragglers. Ha, huh, good. Springer chortled as he pointed to his paint job. Because trust me, the last thing I need is any more paint chipping. Oh, don't I know it. Sunstreaker said as he inspected Springer's paint. In fact, you my friend will probably want to redo your own paint before we get you street worthy. Just say the word and I'll set ya up with a good paint job, no charge needed. Well, that's mighty kind of ya. Springer nodded. Been wanting to get a good repaint lately anyway. As the two talked however, Bulkhead couldn't help but focus in on Springer's behavior. That was weird. Springer's the only bot I know who's stupid enough to not be afraid of scraplets. And he's never been one to care about his appearance. Did something happen to him out in space to change that or something? But the big green bot quickly shook his head. Ah, it's probably nothing. Poor guy's been going around the galaxy in a metal can for millennia, he's probably just a bit wound up. Bulkhead approached Springer and set a hand on his shoulder. Well, we can talk paint and stuff later. Right now, I think we should get to those stories. He jerked his thumb over to Mina, Ejiro and the other humans, the former two looking the most eager out of all of them. They've been wanting to hear your exploits, buddy. Ha, huh, right, let's get to it then. 
Springer approved, though in his mind, makeshift was slightly starting to lose patience. Damn it, can't that ground bridge fix itself any faster? Comma dot dot. Back across the world in the dark side, a certain seeker was also starting to lose his own patience. Makeshift still hasn't opened their ground bridge, or otherwise transmitted their coordinates. Starscream slammed his heads on a control console, frustrated at the long wait. It's been hours. Relax, you said it yourself, remember? Swift pointed out behind him as she sharpened her metal nails with a file. Makeshift's in a space where he can't transmit anything right now, and even if he could, he's got 10 Autobots watching his every move. I'm sure he'll get back to us when he can. Starscream spun around and pointed at her. He'd better hope so. His disguise may be flawless, but he won't fool the Autobots forever. Just then, a holoscreen popped up behind Starscream, with Unacronus' bright red visor prominently shining through on it. Maybe not, Screamer, but he's only gotta fool him long enough to get their ground bridge activated. Makeshift will pull through, he's just gotta wait for the right opportunity. Gur, and what exactly are you doing, Unacronus? Starscream fired back, aren't you supposed to be prepping the attack squad? Done and dusted, Unacronus waved off. The Viacons, Barricade and Blastwave are all ready to go. So, while we wait, I thought I'd pay an old pal a visit. Unacronus out. Wait, you mean the prisoner? Starscream thrust himself back toward the console and shoved his face up to the holoscreen. I did not give you permission to go down there. Unacronus, don't you hang up on, blip. Ah, the air commander slammed his hands against the console again, this time doing some actual damage. Does anyone on this ship actually listen to me? Swift raised an eye ridge and pointed her file to him. So you want an honest answer, or? Gaia, comma dot dot. Down in the prison cells, Unacronus stalked down the hallway, his intimidating form allowing him clearance by any Viacon that happened to be walking by. Once again, no one could get a clear view of him in the shadows, but the blood red of his visor and the pointed wing sticking out of his back made for quite the threatening visage. Finally, he found the cell that Springer was being held in, and he set his gaze down to the Viacons. Open the door, ya slagheads. S sorry, sir, but Commander Starscream made it clear that no one's to, you are K. Just as the Viacon spoke, Unacronus reached down and grabbed him by the neck. In one fell swoop, he slammed the Viacon's head against the wall and sent him crumpling to the ground, making the other Viacon step back in fear. Unacronus glared at the remaining Solitor. You wanna end up like her friend. The Viacon shook his head vehemently. Then opened the slagging door. Without any argument, the foot soldier punched in the coat and opened the heavy doors, allowing Unacronus to go in. He made sure to stay out of the light coming from the center, which is where Springer just so happened to be suspended from. Springer lifted his head and smirked to the Decepticon General. Huh, wasn't expecting any more visitors. Think of this as a courtesy call. Unacronus said, putting his hands behind his back. As a favor to an old friend. Er buddy sent ya down here on his behalf or something. Springer asked. Cause I can tell ya now, I have no clue what Khan would consider me their friend. Oh ho ho, no, no, you're way off base there. The general denied, leaning in slightly as he pointed toward Springer. See, you're the friend in this situation, old pal. He saw Springer's irages rise up in confusion, and that made him chuckle a bit. Hey, yeah, had a feeling you wouldn't know. But trust me, you will soon enough. Springer furrowed his metal brow at the Khan's words. Just who the pit are you anyway, Khan? With a soft chortle of his own, Unacronus put his hands to his hips. Hey, well, I suppose I might as well let ya have the common courtesy. He placed a hand on his chest before introducing himself. My name, is Unacronus, Decepticon General. All at once, Springer's eyes widened again. Number. Seriously. You're, you're the bot who. Coordinated the assault that took out the entire Autobot battalion in the Battle of Tesserus. Unacronus confirmed. Allowed the Decepticons to find the Autobot's secret caches of Energon in Polyhex. And brought the mighty Thunderclash and his team to their knees so they could be captured and shackled in the Inkarskin prison. He wore a sinister grin as he listed his accomplishments. Yeah, that Unacronus. You glitch. Springer belted out, struggling against the shackles. One of my reckon buddies was on that squad. Well then, you should be thankful that he got to live. Unacronus smirked. Who was he, by the way? 
Springer balled his fists, glaring at Unacronus with all the hate he could muster. His name is Rotorstorm. Not that you'd care, Decepti Chump. The general threw his head back with a mighty guffaw. H.A. Ha ha ha. Ah, by Primus, Springer old buddy, you sure haven't changed. If anything, this just made the wrecker angrier. Stop that. I don't know W-H-O-U-R, but you certainly are not by, buddy. Unacronus chortled a bit as he turned away from Springer. Oh, but I am. You just don't know it yet. But you will, and it'll be the last thing you ever find out. The main mech don't take no prisoners, not for long, anyway. You wouldn't believe the amount of Autobots I've done in on this ship. And you. Hey, you're next, friend. He stepped toward the door, being met with the sight of the Viacon he pummeled being taken to the med bay. Unacronus directed his sights to the other one and leaned toward him. You, get in there and, keep an optic on him. He's to be brought to me the moment our operation is over. Yes sir. The Viacon saluted as he stepped into the room, leaving the heavy door to slam shut behind him. Springer sighed and felt his arms go slack, his frustration going down a few notches. Unacronus, just who the hell was that guy? And what's up with the whole, friends, thing? Comma dot dot. Meanwhile, back at the Autobot base, the humans and Autobots had gathered around as Bulkhead regaled them with a tale from his and Springer's record days. Mina and Ajiro in particular were very enthralled in the whole thing, all of them wearing big smiles. So there we were, no communications. Bulkhead went on, waving his arms for emphasis. Low on Energon, surrounded by cons, and what does Springer do? He spun toward the kids, seeing their excited expressions before thrusting his hand toward his pal. Ha ha. Tell him, Springs. Across the room, Springer, was brought out of a small trance and returned his attention to the story. Ah, uh, hey, what I do best. He said with a thumbs up. Ha ha. He chucks his only grenade smack into the primary heat exchanger. Bulkhead exclaimed. Springer gave a shrug, as if it were no big deal. Yeah, seemed like a good idea at the time. The joint went supernova. Bulkhead raised his arms up high. Haha, you should have seen it. Sweet. Mina brought her hands together in delight at the story. Ajiro also pumped his fists, feeling the adrenaline come right back to him. Hell yeah, that must have been freaking awesome. Bulkhead reached around with a knowing grin. Hey, well on the surface, it was. But man, I'm still picking shrapnel out of my backside. Across the room, Windblade rolled her optics. Not surprising, given the size of your backside. At her remark, Bumblebee played a track of canned laughter, holding his midsection as he and everyone else all laughed as well. However, Springer, was quick to go back to his primary focus, Red Alert and May working on the ground bridge. How they could be working on something like this for so long was baffling to makeshift, and a part of him wanted to just go over there and manually speed up the process himself. But he knew he couldn't do that, not unless he wanted to blow his cover. There it is, Springs, signature. Bulkhead pointed to the grenade on Springer's hip. One grenade, one shot. But it was then that he noticed his pal spacing out a bit, so he waved his hand slightly to get his attention. Hey, you all right there, Springs. H huh. Springer snapped out of it yet again. You don't seem like yourself. The rotund Autobot noticed. What do you mean? Springer asked, standing up straight to look Bulkhead in the optic. With a shake of his head, Bulkhead shared his concern. I dunno, you seem, quiet. Springer sighed and gave his friend a smile. Ah, I've been stuck in a can for too long. Maybe a little drive might clear my head. Bulkhead's optics lit up at that. Well, I've got patrol in the morning. You can come with. Well, why not now? And break up the party. Come on, the gang's loving you. Bulkhead encouraged. You gotta tell him about the Battle of Darkmouth Pass. The brighter green wrecker paused for a moment before waving his hand down to the humans. Ah, you should tell him, Bulk. You're better at it. His sights moved down to Mina with a small grin. How about if Mina here shows me the rest of your base? It was then that Bulkhead knew that something was definitely up with his friend. And while a part of him didn't want to do it, he had some time to think about what to do about it. Ah, uh, why yeah, sure springs. Hey, go ahead. Heck, take Ajiro with ya, he seems like a pretty fast fan of yours, too. With another shrug, Springer gave it the okay. Sure, the more the merrier, right? Alright, 
Mina jumped up from her seat and quickly went over, yanking up Eijiro from his own chair. Come on Kirishima, let's get this tour started. Haha, <laughs> okay, okay. Eijiro laughed as he ushered Springer to follow him. Come on, Springer, this way. As the three of them left, however, Bulkhead's features were visibly concerned, which the rest of the team quickly saw. Ah, uh, hey, Bulkhead. Denki piped up. You doing okay? Yeah, just, out of sorts, I guess. The bruiser muttered. Kyoka raised an eyebrow up to him, her eyes shifting between him, Mina and Springer. Wait, don't tell me that you're jealous. That Mina's making a new friend. Come on, Kyoka, seriously. With that vehement denial, though, Bulkhead's optics went down the hall that Ajiro, Mina and Springer went down, an uneasy feeling beginning to churn in his inner workings. Something, something's just not right about Springer. RC stepped in at that moment. Bulkhead, really? He's traveled across space for centuries. And you haven't seen him in Primus knows how long. He could just be rocket lag, or, she sent him a sympathetic smile and placed a hand on his arm. Well, some bots do change, you know. Not Springs. Comma dot dot. Back in the dark side, Springer himself had started struggling against his restraints again, something which the Viacon guard had taken note of. The Decepticon went up and shoved his laser blaster in Springer's face with a warning glare. You're not going anywhere, Autobot. Now stop struggling. It'll all be over soon. The Viacon stepped away, but Springer smirked, ready to put his plan into motion. Yeah, for you. What? Did you really think I'd be traveling alone out there in the universe? Springer asked. I'd be stupid to do that, even if I do like to live dangerously. Bah, don't make me laugh. The Viacon said with a swipe of his hand. Our forces searched your wrecked ship, there was nothing left in it, let alone another bot. At that, Springer's grin increased. Who said I didn't leave him behind? Sawback, Fangblade, Pow, Pow. In the blink of an eye, the two discs on Springer's shoulders shot straight off and began spinning through the air, with yellow, squared off saw blades popping out from around their edges. The Viacon gasped as discs spun through the air at high speeds, ducking just as they were about to hit him. But, unfortunately for him, they rebounded off the heavy door and came flying back, hitting him in the back as he stood up. The discs then came flying back around and smashed into the control console for the shackles, freeing Springer and letting him fall to the floor. Ha! Huh, nice work! Oh no, you don't! The Viacon shot up to his feet and aimed his blaster at the wrecker, you're not going any, shoom! Shoom! Gia! But the foot soldier was forced back again as the flying saw blades came back at him again and before long, they came back. And then... W H R R T S C H Z Z T S C H Z Z T S C H Z Z C H K W H R R T S C H Z Z T S C H Z Z T S C H Z Z C H K The two discs unfurled in midair, transforming into their own robot modes. Or rather, beast modes. The indigo and white one became a robotic wolf, with white detailing around its muzzle and paws while its teeth and claws were yellow like the squared off blades going up and down its, bushy, metal tail. Meanwhile, the crimson and black one unfurled into a big cat-like beast mode resembling a Smilodon, complete with large, yellow fangs in its maw that appeared to be razor sharp. It had black striping along its entire body, and while its tail was thinner than the wolf's, its back was far bristlier sharper in terms of its metallic, fur. A-A-W-W-R-R-O-O-O-O-O. Rar-R-R-R. With a mighty howl and roar, Sawback and Fangblade came crashing into the Viacon, and they immediately began tearing into it with their teeth and claws. Ah, ah, no, no please, don't, i.e. Springer stood to his feet and walked over to the carnage in progress, watching as his saber-toothed tiger and wolf mini-cons ripped right into the poor Viacon sap. Y'all want me to put an end to this? Ah, yes, y'all want me to stop it all? Yes, please. Gotcha. Glad we're on the same page. Springer took out one of his blades and stabbed it right through the Viacon's head, putting an end to his life. As his optics faded, Sawback managed to pull one of the Khan's arms free, and he looked up to Springer expectedly while wagging his tail. Hee hee, yeah, good boy, Sawback. Springer gave the wolf mini Khan a pat on the head, much to the little guy's joy. And, you too, Fangblade, good girl. 
In contrast to Sabak, Fangblade let out a low mule before moving over and rubbing her cheek against Springer's leg. Now come on, let's bust out a here. Before he could do so, though, the heavy door opened and a pair of Viacons came rushing in, only to gasp in horror at what they saw. A.H. W. What in the world hap? Blam. Arg. Neither of them were quick enough to avoid Springer shooting out their knees, helplessly falling to the floor as the wrecker approached them. Sorry fellas. Springer aimed down at their heads as Fangblade and Sabak transformed and reattached to his shoulders. But I've got better things to do tonight than die. Comma dot dot. So, that's pretty much her a lot. Ajiro said as their quick tour of the base concluded. Energon stockpile, power generator, armory. Mina pointed up to Wheeljack with a wink. Everything you need to blow the place sky high. The redhead rubbed the back of his neck with a nervous grin. Though hopefully that doesn't happen, hee hee. Springer chuckled a bit as well and crossed his arms. Hey, yeah, true that. By the way, I wanted to ask, just where is this base located anyway? Ajiro was about to answer, but Mina beat him to the punch. If we told ya, we'd have to rip out your spark chamber. She said with utmost seriousness, taking Springer by surprise. But then, her smile came back in full force. Ha ha, I gotcha. I'm just kidding, we're just a bit outside of Coruscant, Japan. Though I don't know if that means much to you, considering. Can't say it does. Springer shrugged. But hey, always good to know where we're at. Speaking of, I've been thinking of going for a drive. You kids wanna come with? Hmm, well, that definitely sounds awesome. Ajiro concurred. But let's check with the guys first, huh? Wouldn't wanna leave them out of anything, ya know. Come on, let's head back. Within moments, the three were back in the main area, and they had made it back just in time to hear Bulkhead say something interesting. Look, I know Springer better than anyone, and I'm pretty sure he. Yo, Springer waved, garnering everyone's attention. What are you guys talking about? RC seemed ready to speak, but Bulkhead quickly cut her off. I was just telling the guys all about you and me, at the Battle of Darkmount Pass. Hey, that's a heck of a story. Yep. Tell it, Bulkhead demanded with a glare. There was a clear bit of tension going through the whole control room after that, though apparently, Mina hadn't picked up on that. Ah, come on Bulk, we've already talked for a while now. She balled her fists up with an excited smirk. Why don't we all go for a drive and get in some laps around the mountain? But the bruiser was having none of it. Mina, stay out of this. Whoa, Bulk, ease up, huh? Sideswipe pleaded. No need to get testy here. Springer glanced back and forth between everyone, bringing his hand to his neck nervously. I'm not sure if. Tell it. Bulkhead reiterated. Once again, there was a long pause, and Springer's own expression hardened in frustration. Fine. You wanna live in the past, Bulkhead. Finally, the gravity of the situation finally seemed to dawn on Mina as Springer began recounting the story. And while he seemed confident, that didn't stop everyone from feeling apprehensive. The wreckers were trapped between a Decepticon patrol and the smelting pit. The cons were vicious, bearing down on us with everything they had. Me, Bulkhead and our squad engaged the enemy, left them for scrap. Then I made us a way out using their backsides as stepping stones to cross the molten metal. Springer's smile was confident as he set his sights back to Bulkhead. Least I'm pretty certain that's what went down, right? Yeah, that's exactly how it happened. Bulkhead confirmed, making Springer's grin increase. Except for just one thing. And just like that, Springer's smile left. I wasn't there. You could hear a pin drop through the entire base. Everyone had fallen into a stunned silence as their attention went straight to Springer, with even Red Alert and May giving out small gasps. What? Red muttered. I had already left the Wreckers to join Optimus' team. Bulkhead explained as he balled his fists, ready for a fight with Springer. But you wouldn't know that if all you did was look at Springer's public service record. In all of this, however, Mina was still confused. W wait, Bulkhead, what does that have to do with Shum? Og. Ochako's eyes widened in fear the moment she saw Springer move. Mina. No. Ah. And just like that, she was scooped up in the green bot's hand with Mina as well, shocking everyone as he held them in his fists. The Autobots tried to make a grab for him, but he was way too fast. In a flash, Springer, had made it over to the ground bridge controls, pushing Red Alert away as he glowered at everyone. 
Stay back, Springer said, though now, his voice was much different. He held Mina and Ochako up in one hand while making his threat, or else I'll squeeze them into pulp. No, Ishido, Ajiro shouted, Ochako. Momo started forward, but Windblade stopped her. The city speaker shook her head vehemently. Don't, Momo, you don't know what he'll do. Mina and Ochako tried struggling out of Springer's hands, but to no avail. So, Mina tried doing what she did best, use her quirk to get out of a giant robot's hand. However, the moment he felt a burning sensation, Springer shook his hand a bit, rattling the girls together and stopping her. Ah, 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 Mina. Don't think we aren't wise to your tricks. You try burning through my hand, I'll just squeeze harder. The pink girl's eyes widened in horror. S. Springer, why are you doing this? The name is Makeshift, child. I suggest you do well to remember it. Decepticon cowered. Tenya belted out as well. Have you no dignity? Bulkhead grit his metal teeth in anger. Let the girls go and face me, con scum. If anything, though, this only made Makeshift smile with glee. Don't fret. Plenty of fighting to come. As this went on, however, Kyoka slowly but surely moved behind Jazz's leg, the Ludentant glancing down to see her pulling out her phone. He had to do his best not to smile knowingly. That's it, girl, get Izuku and Prime on the horn. They need to get back here, ASAP. Is there even a real Springer? Denki asked. Oh, indeed. Makeshift affirmed. And I expect Commander Starscream is making sport of him. Comma dot dot. Little did Makeshift know, however, that Springer himself was currently scaling along the side of the dark side as it flew high in the sky, traveling to a certain position to wait for the spy's arrival. After a long climb, Springer finally made it to the top, where several Viacon troops were waiting to invade the Autobot base. There, standing in front of all of them, were Starscream, Swift, Barricade and Blastwave, the former practically fuming. Are you certain we are at the coordinated we supplied to Makeshift? Pretty sure. Swift answered, checking her radar once again. This is the place. Then what is taking him? Barricade crossed his arms and grumbled. I dunno, but I'm starting to get antsy. If he doesn't open that ground bridge soon, we might as well just assume the worst. Blastwave just waved his hand. Bah. Blastwave would not be surprised if it did. Makeshift is puny mech who never fights. He is biggest baby. Just then, the sound of heavy footfalls made the Decepticons turn around, and they saw Springer coming toward them with a heavy glare. Maybe your boy was so overwhelmed by the hero's welcome, he got the warm fuzzies and decided to switch sides. What? How'd he escape? Barricade snarled. Ow. Starscream flung his arms up in the air, his irritation finally going through the roof. Can you not see that you are vastly outnumbered, Autobot? But Springer just slammed his fist into his open palm, ready to start throwing down. All I see are a couple o bots that'd vastly enjoy watching me pound some dents into you. Ooh, a snappy comeback. Swift commented. Wonder how that's gonna go for ya. Starscream pointed at the wrecker and ordered, attack. Without a second thought, all of the Viacons charged toward Springer with their blasters at the ready, with laser fire already being unleashed onto him. But just as quickly, Springer unsheathed both of his swords from his back and began swiping them through the air, and subsequently making the lasers bounce off of them and back to the Viacons. With a mighty battle cry, Springer dove into the mass of Viacons, his sword slashing through them in mere seconds. Now is coward killing time. Yeah, Blastwave bellowed as he charged into the battle, trampling any unfortunate Viacon that got in his way to Springer. But just as he was about to reach the wrecker, Sprong, Springer pumped the springs in his legs and leapt up high into the air, doing a frontward flip before coming back down onto Blastwave with a hard kick to the head. Ow! Crash! Grr! Frenzy! Barricade tossed his partner out and the Minicon grinned up to him manically. Let's take this wannabe out! Ha ha ha! With pleasure! Frenzy brought out his shock prod and he and Barricade sprinted toward Springer, though they wouldn't like what awaited them. Springer locked his optics right onto Frenzy and he launched Sawback and Fangblade off his shoulders, the two mini-cons transforming into their beast modes to pounce at Frenzy. W wait, wah, gia, ah. Barricade's optics widened in horror as he watched his partner get mauled. No, get off of, smack, arg, and with a strike to the head from the butt end of Springer's sword, Barricade was brought down as well. 
Springer whistled and recalled Sawback and Fangblade, the two beasts leaving Frenzy alive yet very injured as they took their places back on Springer's shoulders. Eat this, Autobot. Swift and Starscream raised their arms, firing off a missile and a null ray blast respectively. The two collided near Springer's feet, creating a massive explosion that the Wrecker managed to jump away from. From there, he began slicing through every Viacon that came his way, creating some stepping stones that he used to vault himself directly at Starscream. He came down and struck the Seeker right in his shoulders, before then delivering a kick to Swift's midsection to send her sprawling to the floor as well. And right at that moment, a certain sound graced Springer's audio receptors. He craned his head around, and there it was. An open ground bridge. Hem, well, well. Comma dot dot. As all of this was happening, Makeshift had stayed directly at the ground bridge controls, typing in a few commands to help speed up the maintenance process. It was a bit hard to do it one-handed given he still had hostages, but all the same, he did it. And once he did, he got the result he wanted, a fully finished, fully operational ground bridge. About time, he pulled the handle and within seconds, the ground bridge fired right up, and he slowly inched his way to it while the Autobots still had their sights on him. You won't get away with this, Decepticon scum. Strongarm warned. Oh, but I will. Makeshift sneered evilly. The only way this could be more poetic is if Optimus Prime were here to witness it, but I'm sure we'll find him eventually, along with the rest of your pathetic friends. Kyoka smiled internally at that. You have no clue, you bastard. Makeshift backed up to the portal, keeping his guard up as the eight Autobots surrounded him. But despite that fact, he couldn't help but take in the satisfying feeling of victory. Any moment now, the Decepticon battalion would come charging in and they'd have this base torn to the ground within the hour. He spread his arms wide and declared, let's get this party started. And then something unexpected happened. From the portal, a certain bot came leaping through, his blades out and his leg thrust forward to deliver a kick right to makeshift's back. The attack struck and the disguised Decepticon was sent tumbling forward, his grip on Ochako and Mina completely lost. The girls fell toward the floor, but were saved by Bulkhead and RC, all while makeshift crashed into a nearby wall. A-H. Oh oh my gosh. Ochako exclaimed. W what was, oh. Mina shook her head, slightly dazed by what happened. H huh. What? Ah. But she lit up in a massive smile the moment she saw who had come through the vortex. No way. Hey, yes way. Bulkhead smiled as well, happy to see his real old buddy alive and well. Honk honk. Everyone's head snapped around just in time to see Optimus and Bumblebee come rolling into the base, with All Might and Izuku jumping right out of them as they transformed. Kyoka. Izuku screamed, his face riddled with worry. We got your message. Is everything, alright? But the Greenette stopped and just stared in confusion at the sight of not one, but two Springers, one slumped on the floor and the other in front of the ground bridge. Um, did we miss something? All Might scratched his cheek, utterly baffled by what was going on. Long story. Springer stood up from the crouch he landed in as he gave some helpful advice, but I'd shut that hole before the stink comes through. Red Alert hurriedly did just that, flipping the ground bridge's switch up to close it. Optimus was about to pull out his ion blaster and begin asking questions, but before he could, the other Springer kicked right back up onto his feet, glaring at the first Springer as he brought out his swords. And within moments, both Springers were circling around one another in the control room, starting quite the puzzling standoff. The Autobot leader furrowed his metal brow, perplexed by the entire situation. One is a Decepticon, Prime concluded, but which one? Bulkhead knew who the fake was, though, and he was eager to start punching him into metal plating. But before he could, the real Springer waved his own sword in front of him. Ugly's mine. Without saying a word, Bulkhead happily obliged. The very next second, the two Springers began clashing their blades together, both of them displaying clear mastery in swordsmanship. Strikes, parries, even a few blocks here and there. Their movements were wild and yet well-timed, with sparks flying off of their sharpened swords with every hit. However, in the craziness of it all, this left everyone with one simple question, W which one's the real Springer? Tenya adjusted his glasses, trying to recall who was who. Ah, uh, I lost track. Mina's hands flew to her head in panic. One of the Springers struck the other's sword so hard that he was sent reeling back a bit, but he just took it in stride. Hey, 
Well, there is one way to tell. Only one of us can do this. Pow. Pow. What happened next left everyone, though mostly the humans, lost for words. The two pods on Springer's shoulders launched off and transformed in midair, into a robotic wolf and a mechanical saber-toothed tiger. The duo roared in defiance as they collided with the other Springer's face, digging their teeth and claws right in. A-H. No. No. Ah. The imposter Springer tried jabbing his sword at his opponent, but a swift kick to his hand ended up disarming him of one of his blades. The wolf and tiger bots both jumped off and Springer swiped at makeshifts with his own sword, making him fly onto his back and land on the ground with several new gashes in his head. With Springer standing over his defeated opponent, Bulkhead smiled confidently and nodded. Yep, that's my Springs. W-H-A-A-A-T. The humans all cried out at once at the sight of the robotic animals standing next to Springer's feet. What the hell are those? Kyoka shouted. Deployer mini cons. Windblade realized as she slapped her forehead. Of course, I should have guessed that's what those were. Storage pods, my left afterburner. With her jaw slack and her eyes wide, May reached into her pocket and took out her pen and notepad, jotting down this observation without taking her sights off to too small, fearsome and yet somehow completely adorable robo-animals. This just in, Transformers can be small, have non-vehicle alt modes, and beast-like robot modes. She craned her head upwards in disbelief. Is there anything about the Cybertronian race that can surprise me after this? Springer sheathed his blades and glanced over toward Red Alert. You, flip the switch. It's time to take out the trash. The medic gladly obliged to that, but Optimus still had his concerns. Wait, if you simply throw him back to the Decepticons, he will inform them of the location of our base. Don't worry, I've already taken care of that problem. Springer grinned knowingly. And best of all, the cons will get a little gift for giving us so much trouble. He nodded over to Bulkhead as he stepped up. All yours, buddy. Gladly. Bulkhead picked makeshift up and, with a big wind-up spin, he sent the Decepticon through the ground bridge, which closed immediately after. Springer knocked his fist into Bulkhead's arm with praise. Nice lob. Comma dot dot. Back on the dark side, Starscream was far from happy. For one, he was leaking energon from his lip after that strike from Springer. Secondly, the moment he saw the ground bridge close, he felt like he was going to blow a circuit. His ingenious plan had been a failure and all because that Autobot had gotten lucky. He felt like crawling off to a dark corner of the ship to lament his loss, but then a glimmer of hope was sparked as he saw the ground bridge reopen before his very optics. The Decepticons stared at it in disbelief, until Starscream shouted some sense into them. What are you waiting for? Go, now. All at once, the Viacons went straight into the vortex, but stopped and turned right back the moment they saw Springer's body come flying through. Of course, this wasn't Springer, as makeshift signal came back the moment he flew in, and crashed right into Starscream. Swift recoiled at the scene. Whoa, what the, wait. She snapped her head toward the ground bridge, only to see it close. Frag, so close. Ow. Starscream shoved makeshift off of him, the two standing up as the seeker glared at his subordinate. Would you please at least tell me you learned the location of their base? Indeed, Commander Starscream. Makeshift confirmed, wiping some energon from his gaping wounds. But I highly recommend we take caution before we, ah. He suddenly had the barrel of Starscream's null ray in his face, the weapon glowing purple as its owner glowered at him. I have lost all of my patience today, makeshift. Starscream warned. You'd better have a good reason why we should be cautious of the Autobot's base. Makeshift bowed his head apologetically. F forgive me, Commander, but, they said that they had an infestation of scraplets recently, and... Just like that, all of the Decepticons gasped in fear. SS Scraplets. Swift stammered, her rotors visibly shaking dreadfully. Why you can't be serious? But I am. That's the reason why it took me so long to get the ground bridge up, because they were doing repairs on it. Starscream grumbled at that, but at the same time, his sense of better judgment took hold. Alright, fine. We shall take the utmost care in our invasion of their base, in case any scraplets do still remain. He leaned in closer, grabbing makeshift by the collar as he scowled into his optics. Now, where is it? I it's in a hidden warehouse, just outside of. Wait, anyone else hear something? Barricade piped up. 
The air commander snapped around to him and screamed, Barricade. Not now, I. Beep, 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 beep. Uh, screamer. Swift pointed down to makeshift's hip, and the grenade on it was live and counting down. Starscream's optics widened and he shrieked in fright. Og, back, get back. All at once, himself, Swift, Barricade and Blastwave all transformed and sped away from makeshift, leaving any Viacon that was stupid enough not to escape the epicenter of what was sure to be a huge explosion. In makeshift's last words, Oh no, boom, makeshift, you fool, comma dot dot. About half an hour had passed since the incident, and still the occupants of the Autobot base were reeling at everything that had just happened. Their place of solitude had been infiltrated by a Decepticon spy and they didn't even have a clue. It was almost too much to comprehend, but in reality, they probably should have expected it to happen at one point. After all, they weren't called Decepticons for no reason. Still, while the situation was still quite jarring, the kids at least took solace in the fact that everything had turned out well, and that makeshift probably wasn't going to be a problem for them anymore. There was also the fact that, not only was the real Springer actually here, but that he also brought along two very surprising additions along with him. And that's what the 1A students were staring at right now, the robotic wolf and Smilodon that went by the names of, Sawback, and, Fangblade. The two Mechanimal Mini-Cons sat a few feet away, with Sawback sitting dutifully while Fangblade was curled up on the floor. And Mina was absolutely ecstatic. e e e e e e e the two robotic beasts perked their heads up in surprise. They. Are. Adorable. In the blink of an eye, she was directly next to Sawback, the wolf initially on his guard, only for it to disappear the moment she started petting him between his ears. Oh, aren't you the sweetest thing? He's so stinking cute. Ochako agreed as she too went up and started giving him pets on his back. Ooh, aren't you a good boy? Yes you are. Within seconds, Sawback's tail started wagging a mile a minute and his face brightened up, panting in excitement. Ruff ruff. A-H. He's wagging his tail. Momo gushed as she went up to give him a hug. Never in my life would I have thought a robot wolf could be this endearing. Off to the side, Izuku stared at the scene with an awkward grin. Hey, W wow, Sawback's getting a lot of attention. Kyoka raised a brow up at him. Well, can y'all really blame him? More girls love dogs than you might think, she directed her attention over to Fangblade, who had gone back to being curled up on the floor. But that doesn't mean we can't leave her ignored either. The earphone jack user came over and sat next to Fangblade, causing her to peek one of her eyes. Hi there, pretty girl. She reached her hand out and instantly, Fangblade was on her guard, getting up to bristle the metal on her back with a low mule. MMMRROW. Ack. Kyoka gasped. Oh yeah, don't get too close to Fangblade, little humans. Springer piped up from across the room. She doesn't take to strangers well. She'll get used to ya, promise. Ha, huh, would've been nice to know earlier. Kyoka rolled her eyes before offering Fangblade a smile. It's okay, Fangblade, there's no reason to be scared of us. I'm Kyoka, and you can trust me. She saw Fangblade's expression relax a bit before curling up on the floor again making sure to keep her optics on Kyoka the whole time. Hey, hope we can be pals. Izuku came up to her and set a hand to her shoulder. It's okay. I guess no matter where they're from, cats can be a bit testy. Still, this is utterly fascinating. Tenya pointed out. The fact that Cybertronians don't just come in humanoid form, but in animalistic ones as well, it's quite jarring. And super amazing. May said as she continued jotting down notes, all while inspecting Sawback's form. I don't think I could have ever expected something like this. Ooh, I'm going to be so busy with observing these two, it's not even funny. Ajiro crossed his arms, concern written across his features. Yeah, but, as cool as this is, should we really not be worried about the Decepticons trying to find our base after this? Yeah, I mean, what if Makeshift managed to tell him where we are? Denki added. Hey, with that little parting gift I gave the cons, I doubt Makeshift had enough time to explain where we are. Springer said with a reassuring wave. And, besides, if they do ever come round knockin', he raised his fist up to bulkhead and he pounded it with his own. We'll make sure to send them all packin', the wrecker way. Ha ha ha. Man, it's good to have the real you back, Springs. Bulkhead laughed. 
Though just as a test, what if I told you that we had an infestation of scraplets here the other day? Would you be scared? Springer just rolled his optics and scoffed. PFF, scraplets, scared, please, try escaping an exploding planet unscathed and then come back to me about, scared. Bulkhead threw his head back with a mighty guffaw, smacking his hand on Springer's back. B-A-H-A-H-A. Yep, that's you, all right, also, ah, uh, sorry that we couldn't salvage your ship. The cons really did a number on it. Ah, uh, that's okay. Springer shrugged. I wasn't really planning on leaving anyway. That is reassuring to know, Springer. Optimus said as he came over to the two wreckers. Because with the war making its way to Earth, we welcome any help that we can get, he craned his head down to All Might, who was giving him a thumbs up. Both from the local population, and any Autobots who make their way here. He extended his hand to Springer once more. And having you among our ranks would be a great honor. Springer smiled back up to him and nodded back. Please, the honor's all mine, Optimus Prime, sir. He grasped the Prime's hand and shook his wholeheartedly. Just warning ya, though, I can be a bit of a loose cannon, even if I am a team player. I'm certain that we'll be able to work with you well given time. Optimus ensured before craning his head back to the kids. But now, I believe it's time to get you truly acquainted with our allies. A chortle came from Springer's throat and he set his sights on the humans as well. Hey, of course. Mind making the introductions, Bulk. His pal grinned back at him as he led him over to the kids, though at the same time, Springer couldn't shake something off his mind. Unacronus, just what is your deal? Should probably inform Optimus that he's here, but the moment he was greeted by a bunch of young, smiling humans, he thought twice about it. Soon, but not now. Don't wanna bring down the mood, after all. He crouched down to the 1A students before him and raised his metal brow at them. All right kids, let me hear some names and ranks. Comma dot dot. Later that evening, Swift was walking through the hallowed halls of the dark side, making her way to the darkest corner of the ship itself. She hadn't seen Starscream since makeshift was blown to pieces, and she knew for a fact that he probably went off to lament this third straight failure. And when things like this happened, she knew exactly where he went to blow off steam. She stopped in front of the engine room and the doors opened for her, letting her get a good view of Starscream. His back was facing her as he overlooked the massive engine, his silhouette backed by an intense red glow being generated by it. He had no reaction to her walking up to him, his optics not hindering in concentration for a second. You wanna talk about it? No. Straight forward and to the point. Good. Shows you're focused. If this is leading to some sarcastic remark or an, I told you so, then you can leave right now, Swift. But the Decepticon officer raised her hands defensively. Hey, hey, I'm not here for any sort of conflict. That plan you had, it had the potential to work. It's just that we got struck with all of the rotten luck today. She crossed her arms as she directed her attention to the engine as well. Now, I could be sarcastic here, but after what we all went through today, we really don't need to hear that from anyone. Starscream sighed, his wings drooping downward. On that, we can agree. Clang. He pounded his fist into the guardrail, putting a massive dent in it. I just wish things had gone according to plan. Don't we all? Swift affirmed. Now the Autobots have another addition to their ranks, plus two mini-cons. Starscream gripped his head, his aggravation ever growing. What will it take, Swift? What will it take to actually beat these Autobots at their own game? Swift sighed and thought about it for a moment before coming to her conclusion. Honestly, Screamer, I think we gotta face facts, we need more heavy hitters. We're down to five high-ranking cons, one of which Megs doesn't want fighting. Then we've got the Medic, a Mini-Con, and a platoon of Viacons that get smaller and smaller the more they're sent out. Their optics met and Swift furrowed her metal brow at him. We need reinforcements, especially with the new bot over there. Starscream glowered at her, pointing right in her face. If you think I'm actually going to grovel to Megatron and beg him to send reinforcements. Whoa, hold up, I said nothing about going to the boss for this. Swift clarified as she thrust her hands to him. Because hey, you're second in command of the Decepticons for a reason, right? A and there are hundreds of Decepticons scattered through this whole galaxy, remember? She smiled and winked at him. You've gotta have connections with at least some of them, right? 
Starscream's scowl relaxed as the realization hit him, and it was replaced with his own smile soon after. W.Y. Yes. Ho ho, Swift, you might have hit the nail on the head there. I don't need any help from Megatron, I know several Decepticons who would willingly join me in my crusade against this band of Autobots. But then, a ponderous expression came to his features, and he tapped his finger against his chin. Hmm, but who to call in? Hey, well, if you want a little suggestion from me, Swift sent Starscream a knowing grin. I think it'd make things a whole lot easier for you if you kept this, in the family, if you know what I mean. The Seeker blinked a couple times at that, not picking up what she was putting down. Um, no, I don't think I do, wait just a nanocycle. Starscream's demeanor took a complete 180 as he stepped away from her, waving his arms in denial. No, 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 no. I refuse to bring them in. Ah, come on Starscream. The copter fem rounded about on him to stop him from leaving. Even you have to admit that those two will keep all of this under wraps from Megs for you. They're your bro. Starscream got right in her face and argued, I don't care. They annoy the ever-living scrap out of me, I'm not doing it. Listen, I get it, trust me. Swift said with an eye roll. Honestly, those two can be a handful, but you have to admit, they're efficient in what they do. And think about it, if you promise them their own positions by your side, they may be what you need to actually become Decepticon leader. Immediately, she saw Starscream's mood change again, and her knowing smirk returned. So, what do you say, Lord Starscream? Oh, I love the sound of that. Starscream's lips curled up into a devious smirk as well and he snickered nefariously. HM HM, alright, you've convinced me, but don't be surprised if things become unbearable around here for a couple days after this once they arrive. With confidence in his stride, Starscream went over to the nearest control panel and pressed a button, speaking his command loud and clear. Computer, contact Skywarp and Thundercracker. Chapter 16 conflict in deep space. Comma dot dot. Deep within the void of space, you would never expect to see anything huge aside from your typical asteroid or meteor floating through the vast sea of stars. Planets, moons and suns were commonplace, but nothing too out of the ordinary. However, if you knew exactly where to look at a certain angle, you'd be able to make out a faint ripple that was moving past these planets, the surest of signs that something was being cloaked. That something would be the Autobot Kimia Science Colony, or simply, Kimia Science, for short. An absolutely gargantuan starship that had to be the size of a city, namely because it was essentially a city. And on board this vessel lived several different alien races, ranging from organics to carbon-based life forms and many, many more. Chief among them, though, were the Cybertronian scientists that ran the entire facility, Autobots that enjoyed their jobs more than anything else in the galaxy. One of these bots, who happened to be the youngest among them, was currently in his quarters working on a project, his bright yellow eyes concentrated completely on it. He was a mostly red bot who was a rather large individual for his age, and upon first glance, you'd never think he was a scientist. He had rippling pectoral and abdominal areas that were accented by green paint, and they almost seemed organic in a way, though they were completely metal. His arms meanwhile were without question completely metal, painted white while his hands were red. He had black shoulder pads and feet, along with chrome knee pads as well. His helm was also mostly red, again with black accents on his head crest and on the horns that pointed up near the back. And, in the middle of his crest, he had a green symbol that was almost feline-like, one with long ears and huge, sharp teeth. Oddly enough, the helm also very closely resembled that of a certain Autobot leader, but the young bot had always written it off as a coincidence. His dark brown face scrunched up on concentration as he held his invention in his hands, eyeballing it to make sure that everything was in the correct place. Shield generator test, ready to go. A happy, feminine voice spoke up. Whenever you're ready, Applink. This young bot's name was Applink, and he was in the final phase of testing his portable force field generator. If this works, the force dome should shoot right up from the center envelope it. He set his invention into the very middle of the table and pressed down on its center with his thumbs, its lens glowing bright as it began to charge up. Before long, the force field was actually up and doing what it was supposed to do, but then, the generator made a buzzing sound and four holographic error screens popped up from it, leaving Applink confused. 
He narrowed his eyes and leaned closer to it, scratching his chin as he pondered what could have gone wrong. The young bot would soon come to regret this decision. Blam. Ah. Comma dot dot. As that was happening, a rather tall Autobot was walking through the hallway not too far from Appalink's quarters. He was mostly cyan in color, mainly on his torso, knees and painted on the vents in his shoulders. This bot also had some beige on him, mainly on his arms and lower legs, while his upper legs, feet, and hands were all gray. He also had two sets of gray wings as well, one set that were in front of his shoulders while a bigger pair stuck right out of them. He had a cockpit on his chest and the nose of his alternate mode was flipped onto his back, with a pair of silver guns sticking up over his shoulders. His head was somewhat blocky and he had an orange faceplate and yellow eyes that stood out prominently. He had a confident, managerial stride, accented by the yellow, metal briefcase that he had in his right hand. It was obvious that this bot was ready to start a brand new day on the science colony, or rather, his science colony. Welcome, colonists and test subjects, to Kimia Science. Astronauts, aliens, cosmic beings, you're here because we want the best of the best. And you are it. So, who's ready to make some science? Now, you already met one another on the hyperdrive over, so let me introduce myself, I'm Brainstorm. I own the place. Brainstorm grinned to himself as he heard his signature pre-recorded message play over the intercom. It could mean only one thing, more colonists had arrived from Centuros, the planet that they had just been on. They had just transformed Kimia back into starship mode after making a supply run on the nearby planet and, as always, several of the inhabitants were intent on coming with them. Anything to escape a potential Decepticon invasion. It had been a constant sequence since they had initially launched the once peaceful Autobot city dedicated to science near the final days of the war for Cybertron, and in all honesty, Brainstorm himself was still stunned he had even pulled something like this off. The day he discovered that the Decepticons were intent on capturing the city of Kimia to plunder its scientific discoveries, he knew he had to do something. He wasn't just about to let his home get destroyed, no sir. At first, though, it seemed hopeless, nothing he could do or think up seemed good enough to prevent the inevitable. But then he discovered something amazing. Kimia itself was, in reality, a slumbering titan. How he had stumbled across her massive T-Cog, he didn't know. Be it fate or a stroke of luck, he didn't care, but the fact of the matter is that it was a miracle. He managed to reprogram that sucker so the city could transform into a starship and they got the frag off of Cybertron. And the best part, the ship's new thrusters took out the Decepticon fleet that were coming to get them. Ah, still the best day ever in my book. Brainstorm said to himself as he reflected on that memory. He stopped in the hallway and moved his head from side to side, getting all of the kinks out of his gears. But all the same, today's gonna be a great day for some science. Hey, but then again, when isn't it a good time for science? At that moment, though, a nagging feeling began eating at the scientist, leading him to scratch his cheek. Though why does it feel like I'm missing something? You mean like your morning cup of oil? Ah. Brainstorm jumped at least a good 10 feet into the air as he spun around, his briefcase raised in self-defense. But the moment he was met with a big grin and a bright yellow visor, he became slightly more at ease with an exasperated sigh. It was his lead scientist and personal assistant. Proxima, ha, it's just you. Standing opposite of him was a female bot who was primarily white, though her body was practically riddled with cyan, navy and purple detailing all throughout. Her upper chest was smooth and very cylindrical in shape, with shoulders that were basically shaped like circles. Her midsection was a violet color, as were her biceps and face, while her thighs, forearms, and arm sockets were all painted navy. Her legs were navy as well, though she had white paneling on the sides as well, and her feet were mainly a bright cyan and resembled upward-facing toed boots. On her back, she also had two solar panels and a pair of telescopes, one that pointed up and another that came down over her right shoulder. Her helm got wider as it went to the top of her head, mainly due to her uniquely shaped, navy forehead crest that had three additional yellow optics, one in the very center and two near either temple. She also had some cyan near the top of the helm as well as on the circular, lobes, on either side of it. Her main optics were covered by a yellow visor, and she smiled up to her boss as she held up his cup of oil. Hmm, what can I say, sir? You need to be kept on your stabilizers this early. Ha ha. Ah, 
I suppose you're right. Thank you, by the way. Brainstorm reached for the oil and retracted his faceplate, exposing his mouth so that he could take a swig. Ah, now that is some high quality oil. Now, walk and talk with me, what's on the docket today? The duo started down the hall again as Proxima activated a holographic list from her palm, scrolling through it with her finger. Well, first we have that meeting with Glyph and Botanica in the intergalactic greenhouse. They wanted to talk to you about how the plant spores are being utilized for out tests. If it has anything to do with the mushroom incident that ruptured that one andalite's stomach, I swear, that was not planned. Brainstorm assured. How were the lab bots supposed to know that electrostimulation would actually speed fungal growth by several decacycles? Honestly, I'm just glad that man survived. The femme said with a shrug. He's very lucky that the bots managed to sew him right back up. Oh, yes of course. Well, I suppose I'll have to take a few lumps for that one. What else? Proxima scrolled through the list again and continued reading off tasks. After that, Chromidome wanted to see you about some readings he found after a neural net scan on one of our test subjects. And then Team Bullet Train wanted to go over some more of their findings after this latest round of security tests. Brainstorm raised an irish. Are the test prisoners still trying to use that manner of escape? However, his question didn't even need to be answered, because at that moment, the two of them heard clattering and banging from right above their heads, leading both of them to sigh. The taller bot went over to a nearby intercom and pressed an activation button before speaking into it loud and clear, his voice ringing through the whole ship. Attention test prisoners attempting their escape scenario through the air ducts. I don't know what nonsense you learned on Gallic TV, but in real life, the air ducts just go to the air conditioning unit. It's also pretty dusty, so if you got asthma, chances are you're gonna die up there. And we'll be smelling it for weeks, because again, the air ducts aren't a secret escape hatch. They're how we ventilate the facility. I'm surprised that none of them have figured that out yet. Proxima said with a roll of her optics. Anyway, after that, we, boom. Her head snapped up and brainstorm whipped around, their optics wide in shock. What the pit was that? It came from down the hall. Brainstorm went charging toward the direction of the explosion with Proxima right on his tail. Before long, they came upon a certain door that had been jostled ajar, and on the other side, they could hear someone coughing. Oh, Primus, Appalink. The mech grabbed the sliding doors and forced them open, allowing both of them to enter Appalink's quarters. And there, on the ground, was Appalink himself, the young bot sprawled out on his back with his force field generator having landed on his stomach. Sweet Solus Prime, Proxima exclaimed. Appalink, are you alright? The large bot groaned as Brainstorm crouched next to him, offering him his hand. By the sound of that bang, I can only deduce you've hit another snag, EH kiddo. He saw Appalink's features contort into a light scowl before he shoved his invention off of him, and then. WHRRTSCHZZTSCHZZTSCHZZZCHK Appalink's entire back and shoulder pads detached and came flipping around to his chest on a pair of struts, all as his robot mode head pulled into his chest. The result of this exposed an entirely different chest underneath his back panel, which was entirely chromed out and somehow seemed even more muscular than his other chest. The shoulder pads flipped up to form the sides of his new abdomen while his waist spun around so that his feet were facing the opposite direction, only for his legs to bend in and come flush with his thighs. With his kneecaps now forming a new set of feet, his hands then twisted around to the appropriate direction, and a new head came popping up from his chest. And it was then made very obvious where the name, Appalink, came from. By the time he was done, he had transformed, into a large, metal gorilla. And within seconds, he had climbed up onto a nearby tire swing to get away from his troubles. HMPH, well, that's one way to treat your mentor. Brainstorm murmured as he watched the Maximal go swinging up to the upper level of his quarters. Now, now, no need to get in a huff, Appalink. The same, chipper voice from before piped up in support. Your stress levels are through the roof. This just made Appalink roll his optics as he climbed up to the upper level. I told you to stop monitoring my vitals, Ty. He spoke in a deep, gruff, yet still somewhat young voice. He approached a computer console with a rather large screen one that had the words, Tactical Artificial Intelligence, displayed on it. 
or Tai, for short, as indicated below the words. With a small sigh, Tai relented as Appalink plopped down into another large tire. Very well. But just so you know, it's been 47 solar cycles since your last tune-up. Proxima folded her arms and narrowed her optics at Appalink. Sounds about right since that's probably the last time we saw you. You've been working on this invention for weeks, Appalink. She's got a point, young bot. Brainstorm concurred. As much as I would love to work on inventions non-stop, even I agree that keeping yourself healthy is just as important. I know, I know. Appalink's shoulders sagged, the Maximal reached up to grab an absurdly huge piece of alien fruit from his personal stash. I just, I feel like I'm so close to getting it right, I can just taste it. On that note, he took a big bite of the fruit, his metal teeth grinding it in his mouth without a problem. Proxima and Brian Storm couldn't help but glance to one another at the sight. You know, it still baffles me how Maximals and Preds are able to convert organic matter into energy like that, the former noted. Indeed, still looking into that. But Brian Storm waved his hand, getting back on topic. The point is, Appalink, that you should really get out of this room more. He activated the jet boosters on his back and flew up to the upper level, strolling up next to his student as the ape tuned into the intergalactic news. I commend your dedication, but science is a delicate balance and... However, the head of Kimia Science stopped himself when he heard the news. Decepticon attacks continue on the planet of Peridrin, as well as several other Cybertronian colonies and organic worlds across the galaxy, the alien newswoman spoke gravely. Their hunt for Optimus Prime and the renegade Autobot forces continues at the cost of several innocent lives, of which at least 15,000 on Peridrin have been recorded. The news made their sparks sink, their inner workings twisting at the thought of things only getting worse throughout the galaxy. Appalink's metal brow furrowed and a determined chuff escaped his throat as he began typing in a command with his gorilla feet, bringing up a screen that said, Autobot Recall, and it had buttons with the Cybertronian characters for, Y and N with it. He went for the Y button, but then Brainstorm stopped him. Appalink, think before you act. He's right, you know. Ty piped up. Every time you see news like this, we go through this. If we recall the Autobots here and now, we risk bringing the Decepticons here, a place where we strive to keep things peaceful for the sake of the colonists who are trying to escape the Decepticons' wrath. Appalink grumbled, spinning around in his seat to turn away from both of them. But it's just not right. We should be fighting the Decepticons, not trying to hide from them. And we will fight them, when we're damn good and ready. Brainstorm assured. The purpose of Kimia is to research and perfect our scientific findings so that when we do find Optimus Prime, we can provide him and his bots with the resources they need to finally defeat the Decepticons. He thrust his hand to the monitor. Believe me, this news disgusts me as much as anyone else, but we have a ship full of scientists and barely any warriors. Taking on an entire battalion of cons just isn't in the books for us. Gur, I know. Appalink hung his head low. That's just the way things are, but I do miss the good old days. He craned his head up to his wall of pictures, ones that had been taken back on Cybertron way back when. One picture in particular was the day he had graduated and gotten his doctorate, and standing with him was Brainstorm and his entire platoon, his friends. Hot Rod, Skids, Minerva, Drift, Nautica, Road Rage, Wild Wheel, and their leader. The Autobot War Vet, Landmine. And, right next to him in the picture, jumping high into the air with a joyful smile, was his best friend, Flare Up. They were some of the best bots he had ever had the privilege of knowing, but the evacuation of Cybertron had separated them all, and it just made him feel terrible. And Hot Rod, it still pained him to even think about what happened to him. Flare Up had never been the same after that day. Right next to that picture, though, was another small one. It was of himself, Brainstorm, and their respective teacher, a white Autobot with a cylindrical helm and a pair of yellow glasses. Appalink reached up and pulled that one off the wall, with Brainstorm seeing it immediately as well. Yes, I miss them, too, the Blue Mech reassured. After a small moment of silence, however, a blaring alarm suddenly began sounding off as a red light started flashing with it, taking all of them by surprise. Ah. W what's happening? Appalink gasped. Intruder alert. Ty exclaimed. I'm picking up multiple Decepticon signals. 
What? The three bots exclaimed. That has to be a malfunction. Brainstorm asserted. But then, the screen suddenly changed, showing a large, white and blue Autobot with a sloped helm on their screens. The shape of his jawline also made it seem like he had a big, bushy beard, and uncharacteristically for an Autobot, he had red eyes instead of blue. Still, he had an Autobot symbol etched into the canopy on his chest, solidifying his allegiance. Brainstorm, sir. We have an emergency situation. Hull breach. Rail spike. How did this happen? Brainstorm belted out. And please tell me it's not another one of those adventuring conspiracy parties again. I keep telling everyone that we're in space, for crying out loud. Negative, sir. The hull breach came from outside the ship. Railspike brought up a map of the whole starship and zoomed in on the place where the damage was dealt, and with it, there were several Decepticon signals beginning to move into the ship itself. And, by Primus, by my count, there's about seven Decepticons entering through the breach. The trio could feel their jaws drop in shock. Proxima brought her hands up over her mouth worriedly. B but how did they find us? Not sure, but right now, that's not important. Brainstorm furrowed his metal brow. Right now, the most important thing is making sure Kimia's inhabitants stay safe. Railspike, where are these Decepticons going? And what's our position relative to them? After typing in a few commands, Railspike came up with his answer. They're headed toward, wait, no, that can't be right. He snapped his head back up toward the three. Brainstorm, sir, they're headed toward your location. A stunned silence set out through the entire room and Brainstorm narrowed his optics, his fist balling up while his other hand clenched his suitcase. Very well. If this small band of Decepticon stragglers want a fight on my ship, then I'll certainly give it to them. Railspike, get Midnight Express and Rapid Run on locking down the science spheres should anything go wrong. We cannot have these Decepticons hurting our colonists. Railspike nodded to his boss before Brainstorm went to Proxima next. In Proxima, it's probably best if you find a place to lay low. You're not armed in the slightest, so... Don't worry, sir, I understand. Proxima nodded. But if things get bad... I know, but don't worry. We'll be sure to take care of these cons ASAP. With that, Proxima rushed over to a dark corner of the room to hide, leaving Brainstorm and Appalink to hold the line. You ready? Applink nodded to him before ordering, Ty, kill the lights. And thus, the lights went out, shrouding the entire ship in darkness. Comma dot dot. Meanwhile, several light years away in the Friesen system, a string of planets that were covered entirely by snow and ice, there was another Autobot outpost stationed in one of the warmer planets. This one had a climate that wasn't sub-zero, but still cold enough to be completely frozen over on its surface. A climate like this was rare for organic life to find inhabitable, but for the Autobots stationed there, it was just fine for their needs. Which, by all appearances, included building giant war machines. Laser cannons, walking mechs, and massive mechanical arms were all being worked on by several Autobot engineers, a project that was many millennia in the making. And it was the goal of the visiting Decepticons to bring it all crumbling down. From inside the complex at one of its control panels, a female Decepticon appeared, one who was built quite strong by the look of her. In fact, her build appeared to resemble that of a certain Autobot police cadet rather closely. Her shoulders were broad and circular while her legs were angular, her vehicle mode doors propped up on her back like wings. However, her color scheme was far from being considered law enforcement. Her main color was a dark magenta with dark purple highlights around her body, being broken up by bits of teal in her biceps, thighs, midsection in her face. Her helm was also a lot rounder near the top, coming down with face guards near her cheeks like how a Roman helmet would. She chuckled to herself as her hands lit up in a purplish-pink glow, and with a flick of her wrist, the femme projected her own personally designed hard light interface onto the control panel to start hacking into it. Hee hee, I told you guys that getting past the Autobot security systems would be a piece of oil cake, she spoke in a distinctly Hispanic accent. We don't have all day, Nitra. Hurry up. Another feminine voice pressed over her cum link, this one carrying a French accent. Nitra rolled her yellow optics before another voice piped up, this one masculine and commanding. Enough, Shadow Striker. Nitra, do you have the target? He said in his dark, raspy tone. PSH, of course, Skywarp. Sending you coordinates now. 
Comma dot dot. Outside of the facility, two more Decepticons stood waiting for Nitra to let them in. One of them was another female who was mostly purple, with light blue details in her midsection, her biceps, her face and her shins. Her breastplate was formed out of the front of her alt mode and her front tires and vehicle spoiler were propped up on her shoulders, with her rear wheels and her heels. She also had one normal red optic, and one that was shaped like a lens of some sort, no doubt to help her aim with the assault rifle she was holding. But on her helm, she had three additional optics, two above her main one and one in the center of her forehead crest. The bigger bot next to her, looked almost exactly like Starscream, though his chin wasn't pointed, it was much more squared off. Also, his color scheme was pretty much completely different, swapping out the red for silver and the white and blue for black and purple. Also, he didn't have any null rays on his arms, and instead, he carried a pair of black and purple shotguns in his hands. Are you certain that Z target is on site? The femme, Shadow Striker, asked again. Oh, he's here all right. Nitra assured. Okay, you're in. At that moment, the door in front of them opened up and the two bots nodded to each other before proceeding with the plan. Shadow Striker rushed right in and went straight up a series of steps, making her way past an Autobot guard in the process. W wa, huh, hey, you, Z W O M. After hearing a sound from behind him, the guard spun around just in time to see the black and purple seeker literally teleport in behind him. His optics widened in fear immediately. SS Skywarp, snap. In one swift movement, Skywarp, snapped the Autobot's neck, ending his life, before shoving him down the stairs. Hey, never gets old. Skywarp teleported to the next door in his sights next to Shadow Striker, the two waiting for a moment before it opened for them as well. From there, they came upon a large, open area with large construction equipment everywhere they saw, and Shadow Striker decided to get to higher ground. She activated her wrist-mounted grappling hook and went straight to the top of a crane apparatus, all while Skywarp ported to the next door. There was a short pause as he stood in front of it. The door. It opened and he was about to port through, but then it closed on him again. Nitra. He heard a soft giggle from the other end of his comlink. The hacker knew that he could only teleport to areas that he could see, so she got a kick out of messing with him from time to time. She opened the door slightly again and allowed Skywarp through, all while taking the defense mechanisms offline. Turrets are down. Skywarp affirmed what she said when he saw the large weapon suddenly sulk down, leading him to crane his head up to Shadow Striker's location. I am in position, the Decepticon weapon specialist said before moving her head down her assault rifle transforming into a sniper rifle almost seamlessly. She focused in on the area of interest, a section of the base where Autobots were waiting for someone's arrival. Nitra, time to target. Coming in now. Sure enough, in came the bot they had been hoping to see. The head of the entire facility. He was a somewhat tall bot with a mostly white color scheme, with dark blue and red highlights scattered across his person, mostly in his lower legs, chest and forearms. He also had a large, blue spoiler on his back and his helm was black in color, with a pair of horns sticking up either side and a forehead crest in the middle. Add an orange faceplate on top of that and one would say that this bot vaguely resembled a certain Autobot leader, and he would tell you that was no coincidence. Ah, Lieutenant Getaway. One of the Autobot engineers piped up, a blue and white bot that appeared to have propellers on the back of his shoulders. Always good to see you, he saluted. Indeed, highbrow, the feeling is mutual. Getaway returned. So, how are we looking? We still on schedule. HMHM, see for yourself. Highbrow gestured over to a nearby mech that was nearly complete, and in its cockpit sat a green and black Autobot with a tank cannon attached to his left shoulder and treads in his his arms and legs. Hardhead, fire it up. In his seat, Hardhead gave a salute and started up the controls, making the mech move while lifting up its arms. One arm was normal, but the other one had a huge energy cannon attached to it, and he raised it up so Getaway could see. So, impressed, Highbrow asked. Getaway's optics glowed in the light of the cannon, taken by awe. Yes, yes, I certainly am. The Autobot's first batch of working war mechs. He reached out to touch the cannon, he was so taken by it. This will ensure the Decepticon's defeat, in his mind, he added, and my ascension to my rightful place is the next prime.
Little did get away know though, that he was in the crosshairs of a certain crack shot. Just a little, bit, further, however, just as Shadow Striker was about to have him in her sights, a loud alarm suddenly started blaring through the entire base, taking everyone, including her, off guard. Qua. She decided to go for broke and took the shot when Getaway was just a hairs off from her center, and unfortunately, she missed. She was very upset about that, given the sneer on her lips. Shadow, hold position. Skywarp ordered as he warped in through the main door. We'll take over. And just like that, he was in, and he started firing upon all of the Autobots in the room. Comma dot dot. Across the stars, a certain other seeker was currently stalking through the halls of the Kimia Science Colony, keeping his optics peeled as he covered the rear of his Viacon squadron. Like Skywarp, he was near identical to Starscream save for the paint job and pointed chin. This time, he was mostly blue with black as a secondary color, with additional red and white pinstriping on his wings. He also held a heavy pulse rifle in his hands, one that matched his color scheme pretty well. After a few minutes of walking, however, they came upon their destination, and Thundercracker nudged his head to the room. All right, we're all clear on the plan. The Viacons all nodded to him. Good, now get in there. Without question, the seven Viacons slowly crept into the room, unaware that they were being watched from on high. However, just as they made it about ten feet in, the remnants of a half-eaten fruit fell in front of them, and their weapons aimed at that immediately which distracted them from the 15-ton metal gorilla that came leaping down at them. Bra HHH. Without wasting a second, Appelink grabbed one of the Khan's legs and flung him across the room, before grabbing another and slamming his head down into the floor while roaring again. One of the Viacons started firing his weapon, but was cut off when Brainstorm came swooping down and grabbed him by the neck and arm. Sorry, punk, not today. He flung the con across the room into another one and then rolled between the final two, smacking their heads together to send them staggering to the ground. H.A. You Viacons aren't so tough. I. Shwoom. Ah. Brainstorm had to duck the moment he heard a very loud set of jet engines come blasting into the room, a Cybertronian tetrajet flying right over their heads and transforming up onto the upper level. Their optics widened when they saw it was a seeker, and not just any seeker. Thundercracker. Appalink exclaimed. Gentlemex. Thundercracker nodded. Sorry to crash the party. How did you find us here, Decepticon? Brainstorm demanded, aiming his shoulder blasters at the Blue Seeker. Thundercracker couldn't help the small smirk on his features. HMPH, a little birdie on Centuros informed me about your stay there, Brainiac. And they were smart to do so, too. Because of them, their planet will be spared Megatron's wrath, maybe, hopefully. He pulled out something from his hip and turned toward the main computer. Anyway, I've got my own work to do. Take care of them, boys. Oh no, you don't. Appalink went to jump after Thundercracker, but was immediately stopped when one Viacon fired tasers from its arm, hitting him right in the back and bringing him back to the floor. Appellant Q. Brainstorm went to help his former protege, but quickly found himself being assaulted with tasers as well. Before long, all six Viacons had launched their own tasers into the two, with three taking Brainstorm while four took Appalink. Thundercracker meanwhile had reached the main computer and hooked up some sort of device to it, one which glowed red the moment he activated it. And unfortunately, Ty knew exactly what it was. A.H. No. Security protocols failing. Brainstorm, Appalink. Thundercracker is extracting the Autobot agent database. A brief chill went through both bots, but they were quickly overwhelmed when the electric shocks became more intense. However, at that moment, a certain bot decided that she couldn't stand by any longer. Hey! Thundercracker raised his head up and craned it around to see Proxima, the lead scientists coming at him with her fist raised and ready to strike. Don't you dare do tea, boom! Ow! What sounded like a shot blasting through the air was actually the sound of Thundercracker's powerful thrusters, the Seeker having used them to rush past Proxima and take her off guard. With a single strike to the back of her head with his rifle, she was out cold. Sorry, ma'am. Thundercracker caught Proxima and laid her down on the floor gently. Nothing personal. No. Proxima. Brainstorm hollered in pain. Appalink tried to yank himself free from one of the tasers, fearing for Proxima's safety. Just then, though, something unexpected happened. 
One of the Viacons actually slipped on the half-eaten fruit on the floor, taking his taser with him and freeing one of Applink's arms. The metal gorilla grinned and laughed victoriously before his eyes started glowing a bright orange with powerful energy. He belted out another roar before taking the taser wires of two other Viacons and yanking them off their feet, spinning them around in the air to knock over all the others. Before he knew it, Brainstorm was freed as well. Extraction at, crash, 32%. Gia. The two Viacons came hurtling through a window and passed Thundercracker's head, making him grumble and pop a few struts in his neck. Time to get my hands dirty, he blasted down to the bottom level just as Brainstorm and Applink were regrouping and open fired on them with his pulse rifle, its blue energy blasts peppering them and forcing them to step back. With a small smirk, Thundercracker aimed his weapon up and, with a press of a button, launched three pulse rockets up at a status pod that was hanging directly above the duo. And then, wham. Comma dot dot. Back at the base in the Friesen sector, Skywarp wasn't having as much good luck as his brother. One of those mechs had gotten right in his way the moment he had getaway in his sights, blocking his shot with an energy shield on its arm. He glowered up to the Autobot in the mech, but was quickly met with a hard swing from the massive arm, careening into a nearby machine back first. That's as far as you go, Decepticon. Hardhead bellowed, towering above Skywarp as he readied himself to defend Getaway. Skywarp slowly got to his feet, quickly spying Getaway on the lift. Yeah, not likely. W-H-R-R-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-C-H-K. In a split second, Skywarp transformed into his Tetrajet mode, flying straight up to the upper catwalks. Nitra, rendezvous with me, we need to cut off Getaway. I'm all over it. Nitra sounded off from the control panel she was at. She was on Skywarp's tail in seconds, running over to a nearby wall to scale it to an upper level. There, she spotted her commander shooting up after Getaway, who had just exited the lift and had transformed into his own vehicle mode to, well, get away. Oh no, you don't. Nitra rushed over to a smaller lift, one made for moving tools and other materials, and hacked into it with her special hands, jumping up onto it as it rushed straight up. The Fem reached the top level and leapt off over to the catwalk, transforming into her Cybertronian truck mode as she hit the metal. She could see Getaway on a different catwalk a bit further ahead, and before she knew it, Skywarp had flown over to her position, and he had Autobot flyers on his tail already. Change of plans. I have to deal with these jokers, so don't let the target get away. That probably won't be easy, you know. Nitra pointed out. It's kind of his name. Him escaping is not an option. Skywarp pressed further. But just in case, set up an escape route in case things go south, though they'd better not. Gotcha. W-H-R-R-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-C-H-K. Nitra transformed into her robot mode briefly when she ran into two Autobot soldiers running up to her on the catwalk, so she decided to kill two birds with one stone. She pulled out a triangular-shaped device from her storage compartment and tossed it at them, making them stop in their tracks. The device blinked and beeped rapidly, making them think it was about to explode, but then it didn't. At first, they laughed victoriously, but were quickly shot dead when Nitra brought out her weapon one that resembled an Uzi, and shot them dead. It was then that she heard, all mechs, fire on catwalk, level 3. Nitra's head snapped down to see Hardhead aim his mech's arm up and blast a concentrated beam up at the catwalk she was running across, cutting through the metal grating with ease. Oh, scrap. W-H-R-R-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-C-H-K. She was back in vehicle mode once again as the laser cut through the grating a second time, and with her gunning the gas, she blasted off of the falling catwalk, successfully avoiding falling to her doom. Can't get rid of me that easy. The moment she turned the next corner, she was met with several Autobots aiming their guns at her, so she transformed yet again, and then disappeared in a flash of purple light. What? She's gone. Find her. As the Autobots scrambled to find the rogue con, Getaway was led into his quarters, flanked by two Autobot guards. The three bots transformed and Getaway went over to his desk, leaning on it as he breathed heavily. How, did those cons get here? He snapped. I'm uncertain, sir, but don't worry, we'll, huh. 
But the guard was cut off when Nitra suddenly reappeared out of nowhere between him and the other bot. He went to shoot her, but she dodged, making him shoot his compatriot in the head instead. Nitra then wrenched the gun out of the bot's hand and shot him dead as well, before then spinning around and aiming her own weapon between Getaway's optics. Lieutenant Getaway. A smirk lined Nitra's features as the two stared at one another, a clear tension in the air while her finger was on the trigger. But then, she laughed and pulled her weapon back. Ha! Huh, you have no idea what I had to do to get make meeting happen. From outside, she could hear multiple Autobots shouting for Getaway, so she had to make this quick. Relahete, I'm not gonna kill you. I mean, I am the one who set off the alarm. Nitra, it's Skywarp. The black and purple seeker called in over the comms. Do you have the beep? With a simple touch to her head, Nita deactivated her comms, all while waltzing over to Getaway with a knowing smile. Okay, listen, I'm here to make a friend, and to show you something I found, she put her fingers together in the shape of a picture frame and pulled her hands back, creating a screen with an interesting picture on it. Getaway's optics widened immediately. It was of him, and a certain Decepticon arms dealer exchanging goods. In particular, it was the very technology that was powering his mechs. The bot was shorter than he was and had a smarmy look to him, with his yellow and purple color scheme, black, boxy helmet and a pair of purple optics that resembled shades. Add on the toothy smirk and it was obvious that this bot was a total schemer. H. How, where did you? The extranet is a pretty big place, amigo. The hacker said with a shrug. You'd be surprised what you can find if you go deep enough. Anyway, that's not what's important. What is important is that Swindle's latest customer is quite the interesting one. Nitra sauntered over and ran a hand across Getaway's shoulder. Tell me, what would happen if the Autobots learned that one of their top lieutenants was actually getting their tech from the enemy? And with a wave of her hand, Nitra brought up even more pictures of Getaway and Swindle together, all of them from separate occasions. Think of what that could do, for your bid to be the next prime. What do you want? Getaway said with narrowed optics. One of the highest ranking lieutenants in the Autobot ranks. Ha! Huh, I always wanted a friend like that. Nitra brought all of the images together, leaving just the first one left. So, I was thinking, I won't let these images appear on every hollow screen in the galaxy, and you help out your new friend every now and then. What do you say? Just then, the door started lifting as the Autobots got to work cutting through it, calling out to get away from the other side. Clock's ticking, amigo. Getaway balled his fist in rage. On the one hand, he abhorred having to work with yet another Decepticon, but on the other, he couldn't let his reputation be tarnished. Lest his rightful place as the next Prime be put into jeopardy. As if I had a choice. Now what, friend? Nitra smirked victoriously, closing the distance between her and her new, friend. I'll be in touch. She touched her finger to his faceplate with a goodbye, boop. Before disappearing with a wave of her hand, teleporting back to where she had set up her escape route device. She reactivated her comm link and spoke into it, sorry, boss, my comm got knocked offline for a cycle. Anyway, the mission failed. Target escaped. She heard a dissatisfied growl from the other end. RRMPH, get back to the ship. If anything, though, Skywarp's irritation made her all the more pleased with herself. He'd be so fun to annoy with when they get out of here. Comma dot dot. Appalink, Appellant Q. MMPH, ah, uh, Appalink blinked his optics as he started coming to, his head still in immense pain after, he was pretty sure the stasis pod he used as his bed had been shot down and landed on his head. CHK Chick. The robotic ape's vision cleared as he heard Thundercracker cock his pulse rifle, the seeker slowly closing in on him. He glanced to his left and saw Brainstorm, still knocked out. And to his right was his experimental force field generator, which was just in arm's reach. Appalink. Ty screamed out for him. The download is nearly complete. Soon Thundercracker will have the location of every Autobot in this galaxy. Thundercracker narrowed his optics down at Appalink and aimed his weapon at him. I'll be sure to send him your regards, monkey. And that's all it took for Appalink to grimace right back up at him, disgusted by the term he used. I'm not a monkey, he reached for the generator and activated it, sliding it across the ground till it stopped next to Thundercracker. It started working briefly, and then the error signs came up. What that's supposed to do something? 
Instead of answering, though, Appelink just finished his statement. I'm a scientist. Bam. Appelink covered his face as another wave of energy blasted through the room, knocking the stasis pod off of both him and Brainstorm while also sending Thundercracker flying into a wall. Appelink, maximize. W-H-R-R-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-C-H-K. With a powerful roar, Appelink transformed into robot mode and leapt to a nearby wall, pulling down his own personal weapon, a Tesla cannon. With a flick of a switch, he turned it on and sent a blast of electrical energy at Thundercracker, making the Seeker ride in pain. Yeah. W-H-R-R-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-C-H-K. Thundercracker forced himself to transform, hoping to escape, only for things to be made worse for him. Boom. The lightning struck into his thrusters, inadvertently activating them and sending him straight through the door. It was all he could do to stay on course long enough before going straight through a window and into the vastness of space. Within seconds, the Viacons all regained consciousness as well, and were met with the rather angry face of Appelink. A.H. Retreat. The cons all entered their jet modes simultaneously, blasting out the same window before it sealed shut, leaving Appelink to beat his chest in victory. Ah, but then, the mighty Maximal spun around and rushed over to Brainstorm's side, his mentor holding his head. What in blazes happened? Long story, but right now, we need to check on. Extraction, 90%, the duo felt their energon run cold at the sound of TAI's voice, now beginning to slow down as the virus continued its work. Appelink and Brainstorm quickly got to the upper level of the room and the Maximal ripped out the hacking device, crushing it in his hands. However, that didn't help matters much. System failure, 98%. Brainstorm rapidly went over to the console and began typing commands. Hang in there, Ty. He exclaimed, only for the screen to glitch out and then go totally black. The two bots were in utter shock. Ty, T Ty. After a few seconds, thankfully, Ty's logo came back up on the screen, her voice filled with relief. Ha, huh, virus has been quarantined. I'm running diagnostics on the core database and restoring systems now. The duo also sighed in relief as well, all while hearing a certain voice pipe up from behind them. Ah, that was not pleasant. Proxima muttered, rubbing her helm in pain. Proxima. Brainstorm went right over and held her steady on her feet. Are you alright? I believe so, sir. The lead scientist affirmed. Just a bit of neck ache. She went over to TAI's console to join the duo, still somewhat in disbelief over what happened. I, I'm still kind of shell-shocked by all this, to be honest. Brainstorm nodded solemnly. Indeed, we've had run-ins with Decepticon forces in the past, but, none of them managed to find or even infiltrate Kimia. He balled his fist and smashed it against the wall. They must be growing more confident. Appelink nodded as he leaned against a nearby table. Agreed. Our safety in space may soon come into question. Ah. Oh my goodness. Ty gasped, bringing everyone's attention right to her. I, I just received a signal on a secure Autobot frequency. What? The trio exclaimed. It's originating from a solar system in a rather isolated quadrant of the Milky Way. Ty elaborated further. Seems like it's coming from the third planet of its sun and, oh my. You, you all are going to want to hear this. Ty patched the message through, and what the three bots heard next managed to shake them to their very sparks. After 300 stellar cycles of waiting, our search for the Ark can finally get underway. A collective gasp came from the trio, knowing full well who that voice belonged to. No, I it couldn't be, Appelink stammered. After all this time, Proxima questioned, is, is that really? Brainstorm couldn't help but beam beneath his faceplate. It really, truly was him. Optimus Prime. They heard the Prime continue his message, continuing to be utterly stunned by what they were hearing, and time and patience have yielded yet another reward, a new world to call, home. We live among its people now, hiding in plain sight. But watching over them in secret. Waiting, protecting. And, with the help of our new secretive allies, this world's greatest hero, and our four young friends, we may just be able to accomplish our mission. Appelink couldn't help but furrow his irages at that last part. Secretive allies. World's greatest hero. What in the world does that mean? Can't say. Keep listening, young bot. Brainstorm urged. 
I have witnessed their capacity for courage, as well as how great their powers truly are compared to their size. In that sense, though we are worlds apart, like us, there is more to them than meets the eye. There was a brief pause before they heard Optimus conclude his message. I am Optimus Prime, and I send this message to any surviving Autobots taking refuge among the stars, we are here, we are waiting. And just like that, the message cut out, leaving Brainstorm, Proxima and Appalink all completely astonished by what they just heard. Please tell me this isn't a dream. Proxima muttered, her voice wavering with emotion. Could, could this be the moment we've been waiting for? Optimus Prime, is alive. Appalink smiled. And he's found a new world where the Ark could potentially have landed. Brainstorm broke out into an uproarious laugh. Ha ha ha. Yes. Everyone, this has been the moment we've been waiting for. He snapped his head back to the screen eagerly. Ty, can you trace that message back to its point of origin? Affirmative, sir. Ty dutifully said before running the data through her systems again. Hmm, let's see, got it. She displayed the universal coordinates on her screen before zooming in on them, showing an image of a small, blue planet with seven large landmasses on its surface. This is it, an organic planet in solar system D84. The inhabitants supposedly call it, Earth. Proxima's optics widened beneath her visor. Whoa, well, we're actually near that system, so that's good news. But that planet is way out in the boonies if that's the case. I didn't think any intelligent life inhabited that sector of the Milky Way. The head of Kimia Science couldn't help but raise an irage at that. Seriously. Earth. That's what they call it. Might as well call it, dirt, if that's the case. However, Brainstorm then waved his hand. Bah, who cares? Better than nothing, I suppose. He clapped his hands together and rubbed them in anticipation. All right people, let's get this tub turned around and head right for that planet. Prime's waiting for us and we cannot let him down. W wait, Brainstorm, sir. Appalink interrupted, bringing his mentor's attention to him. I, I think we should help Optimus Prime's message along, don't you think? This made Brainstorm tilt his head, so Appalink explained. Think about it, this, Earth, place isn't exactly in a well-placed sector of the galaxy, so who's to say that Prime's message won't reach out all that far? B but I know that this ship can boost the signal on the secure channel well enough to reach further out. He typed in a command on the console, bringing up the Autobot recall screen. I know it's a risk, but shouldn't it be one we're willing to take? Well, Brainstorm placed a hand to his chin in thought. Appalink saw his mentor's hesitation, so he decided to pull out his winning card. He reached over to the wall and pulled off the picture of him, Brainstorm, and their respective teacher, handing it to him. Do you remember the mantra that Quark lived by? The one he passed on to us so long ago. With a heavy spark at the memory resurfacing, Brainstorm took up the picture in his hand, his optics zooming in on the teacher he so highly respected. Don't accept the universe as it appears to be. Dare to see it, for what it could be. He took a deep intake of air and sighed heavily, nodding to Appalink affirmably. Right. Let's do it. Appalink and Proxima broke out into beaming smiles before the former pressed the Y button on the recall option, sending out Optimus' message out across the universe with a massive boost to it. The galaxy-wide map reappeared and, all at once, several Autobot signals came popping up on it, making all of them smile widely from lobe to lobe. Establishing Autobot connections, Ty happily proclaimed. Appalink couldn't help the warm feeling in his spark as he watched several Autobots' names go by, including several of his old teammates. Drift, Landmine, Nautica, Minerva, Wild Wheel, Skids, and then the names stopped scrolling once they got to a certain face. It was a female Autobot with light yellow metallic features, but her lips were painted a striking orange color. Her helm was sterling silver, with parts of it painted brown and extending down past her cheeks and over her chin like a strap. The top was adorned with a prominent, yellow head crest that was sweeped back toward the rear of her helm, almost as if it were being blown through the wind. She also wore a playful smirk in her photo, and had a pair of orange aviator goggles over her blue optics. And before he knew it, Appalink was graced with her voice as she called in. Appalink, is that you, love? Flare up piped up, her cockney accent reverberating through the room. Ha ha, it's been too long. Yes, Flare, HMHM, yes it has. Appalink affirmed. By the well of all sparks, Flare up. 
Brainstorm exclaimed. Proxima smiled and laced her fingers together. Is that really you, dear? Oh, it's so good to hear your voice after all this time. On the other end, the femme named Flare Up gave a breathy laugh, still trying to comprehend that this was all happening. Brian Storm, Proxima, you're there too, wait a tick, I just looked at what I'm contacting. How the bloody pit am I calling the city of Kimia? Hee hee, that you are, Flare Up. Brainstorm confirmed, though it's not exactly a city anymore. Turns out you never know you're living on a titan until you accidentally discover one of its most important components. He tapped the side of his head. Thankfully, yours truly had the know-how to rejigger that massive T-cog so that Kimia could take on a starship form. Been bouncing around the galaxy ever since. Brain, you never cease to amaze, you know that. Applink approached the console, honestly a bit confused. I'm actually a little surprised we didn't ever come across you, flare up. Well, you know me. Always on the move, Flare Up said cheerfully. Can never stay in one place for too long, though by the sounds of things, that might have to change. Her voice could only be described as, bubbly, as she giggled with glee. Hee hee, can you believe it? Optimus Prime is back. With a single nod, Applink laughed along with her. Ha ha, yes, it's pretty unbelievable. You've got the coordinates of that planet, right? Sure do. And, it looks like I'm actually pretty close to that solar system. I've been tailing a small Decepticon ship that I saw headed in that direction, so hopefully I can get there before IT does. That got everyone's attention very quickly. Was it a big ship? Proxima asked. Not really, looked like it could only seat one. Flare up replied. But believe me, I'm gonna make sure I run as fast as I can to get to that little planet. And, when I get there, I'll be sure to let Prime in. The others know that you blokes are on the way. Much appreciated, flare up. Safe journey. Brainstorm saluted. Applink grinned one last time before signing off. See you soon, flare. HMHM, right back at ya, big guy. Flare up out. Cheers. And with that, the transmission was cut, leaving the three to gather their thoughts. Ha, huh, well, I suppose we have some work to do, don't we? Brian Storm asked, with Applink and Proxima both nodding back to him. Well then, let's get this tub moved around and headed to Earth. He reached up and activated his comlink. Railspike, this is Brainstorm. Hope you and the rest of Team Bullet Train got that message, because we need to make a U-turn, stat. Comma dot dot. Back across the galaxy, Getaway was fuming in his office over what had just happened. Several Autobots were now dead, and for what? Just so that some Decepticon hacker could blackmail him. But that wasn't even what irked him. No, rather, one of the highest ranked seekers had been among her infiltration team, more than likely the one in charge. This was bad. Not only would be the Autobots under his command be at an all-time morale low, but with all the damage the cons caused, this whole attack could have set them back by M-E-G-A-C-Y-C-L-E-S. Getaway's hands clenched his table, his frustration growing by the second. But then, beep, 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 the lieutenant's head snapped up at the sound of his computer going off, perplexing him greatly. He reached up and typed a command into the holographic interface, and a message came up. One that he had not expected to ever hear. After 300 stellar cycles of waiting, our search for the Ark can finally get underway. It was him. It was truly him. There was no mistaking his voice for anyone else's that was, without question, Optimus Prime. Damn. Getaway thought to himself, there goes Easy Street to be the next prime. However, the more he listened to Optimus' message, the more Getaway became intrigued. A new planet, with powerful beings that were aiding the team of Autobots that were there. Hmm, how interesting. Wonder if these beings can take Decepticons in a fight. By the time the message ended, Getaway was left with two things, coordinates to the planet that Prime was on and a whole slew of cheering engineers, scientists and soldiers that he could hear outside his door. It was obvious then that they had all heard Prime's message, and to this, Getaway could only shrug. Well, at least their morale is back after that disastrous Decepticon attack. He stood up and went to gaze out his window, seeing all of his men celebrating in their own way. Good, maybe this is the kind of boost they need. We might have suffered quite a few setbacks today, but if we get back to work, we may be able to finish at least a platoon full of these mechs soon. He set his sights up toward the sky outside. 
Optimus Prime, I welcome you back with open arms. But, when I win this war for you, I hope you will be quick to recognize ME as the next true prime. Comma dot dot. Zat was a disaster. Nitra rolled her optics as Shadow Striker sneered down at her, the Decepticon sniper clearly upset after that failed mission. The two of them, along with Skywarp, were currently flying through space at hyperspeed, headed to their rendezvous point where they'd pick up the rest of their squad. Though at the moment, Shadow Striker didn't care about that. How in Z-World could you have let him escape? He was directly in your sights. Hey, his name is Getaway, remember? The hacker argued back. His whole thing is that he's an escape artist. Honestly, it doesn't surprise me that he got out of there as quick as possible. However, it was then that Nitra put on a small smirk. You sure that you're not the one who's sore here, Chica? The way you worded that is, had him in your sights, makes it sounds like you're beating yourself up more than anything. Shadow Striker's sneer turned into a full-on grimace and her hands balled up in rage. Why you insolent, little? The femme was about to backhand her cohort, but then, ZWOM. From out of thin air, Skywarp appeared, holding his hands up between the two. Enough. You ladies need to slow the frag down and cease your pointless arguing. He glared at both of them to assert his authority. What's done is done. We can't change the outcome of our mission, no matter who caused what. All we can do is move on with the next mission. Skywarp's right. All this arguing isn't getting us anywhere, Miha. Nitra agreed endearingly. Besides, with all the damage we did to that facility, those Autobots are gonna spend megacycles getting everything back online, hee <laughs> hee. All she got in response from Shadow Striker was a growl and a huff, the sniper crossing her arms in disgust. Nitra just rolled her optics right back. So, boss, I assume we're at the rendezvous. Yep. Thundercracker should be getting back any, beep, 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 what the, what now? The two femmes were a bit confused by the alarm as well, until they set their optics out the front window of the ship. And their features contorted in panic at the sight of a certain seeker uncontrollably blasting right toward them. Mared, Shadow Striker rushed toward the pilot's seat and jerked the controls around, turning the craft around before Nitra opened up the rear hatch. Gah, what are you two, Crash? Bra. Within seconds, Skywarp was slammed into by Thundercracker, the latter's booster engines finally being cut off after the collision. W-H-R-R-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-T-S-C-H-Z-Z-C-H-K. Ah, that didn't go well. Thundercracker rubbed his head, dazed and confused at what was going on, for all of five seconds before he was shoved right to the floor. Ow. H hey, what's your, oh. The blue seeker cut himself off when he saw his brother glaring down at him, his optic twitching. Skywarp, I, s sorry about that. Sorry. What the pit were you even doing? The two seekers stood up as the rest of Thundercracker's Viacon squadron entered the small transport ship as well. Hurtling through space like an out of control meteor. Thundercracker's circuits finally cleared up a bit and he grit his metal teeth as the memory came back. Those damned Autobots, they managed to beat us back. You let, a bunch of nerds beat you. They had an ape maximal. Thundercracker argued, with a lightning gun. Skywarp facepalmed as Nitra gave a shrug. Well, at least we're not the only ones who failed their mission, EH. The Blue Seeker didn't take too kindly to that. Oh, so you failed your mission and you're giving ME grief, Skywarp. What the frag is that all about, huh? Because now we've all failed, Thundercracker. Skywarp emphasized. If we want to take down these Autobot settlements, then we cannot afford to lose to them. As they argued, a small blip sounded off from the ship's communicator, catching Shadow Striker's attention. Ah, ahem, she called back. Thundercracker got right up in Skywarp's face and poked at his chest. Well, now whose fault is that? Oh, I know, it's yours. If you had just gone with my plan of having us all infiltrate the ship full of nerds, like I suggested, maybe we wouldn't be in this situation. The bickering continued on in an undiscernible jumble of shouting as Shadow Striker rolled her optic, getting up to head back and literally knock their heads together. Enough. You are both imbeciles. She derided as the two seekers heads spun. However, I believe that our fruitless endeavors may yet be corrected. Skywarp and Thundercracker collected themselves and eyed Shadow Striker curiously. For you see, we have just intercepted a transmission from deep space, and Z both of you may be interested in where it came from. 
The Seeker duo, along with Nitra, followed Shadow Striker up to the cockpit before she hit a single button, letting the transmission through. Skywarp, Thundercracker, do you copy? Ah, the brothers gasped simultaneously. S, Starscream, Thundercracker asked. Ha ha, excellent, my transmission got through. Starscream laughed. Brothers, it's so good to hear your voices again. Immediately, Skywarp was suspicious. Starscream never said anything like that to them unless he needed something. What do you want, Starscream? We're not in the best of moods right now after our latest mission failure. Hmm, I see. In a bit of a slump, are we? Starscream asked. Well then, do I have good news for you. I have come across a planet where a small battalion of 10 Autobots have been stationed. My team and I have been stationed here for several solar cycles already, but we find ourselves outmatched. They could practically hear the air commander's insidious smirk as he spoke. But, if we were to combine our forces, then I think that we'd immediately have a clear advantage over these Autobots. Everyone glanced to one another before Nitra spoke up. Wait, your crew, the one with the high-ranking officers, the shifter spy and the munitions expert, is having problems with 10 Autobots. Agreed. Shadow Striker nodded. With a Team Z size of yours, surely they cannot be that. Optimus Prime is with them. A stunned silence overtook the four Decepticons at the news. Optimus Prime was alive. After a few seconds, Starscream continued. Yes, now you understand why they have been such a thorn in our sides lately. Makeshift has already been eliminated by a new Autobot arrival, so we need all the additional hands we can get on this one. So, what do you say? Are you in or out? There was another short silence throughout the ship as the four cons eyed one another again, thinking it over in their heads. However, with knowing smiles, they all reached the same conclusion. Bringing down Optimus Prime, it would be what put them on the map as Decepticon War Heroes. Hey, alright Screamer, we're in. Skywarp accepted. Just give us your coordinates and we'll be there as soon as, Shuwam. Just then, a bright green glow started shining from out in the middle of space, and in front of their ship, a large space bridge had appeared. Ah, never mind, Thundercracker shrugged. I suggest you all come through the bridge as soon as possible. We cannot keep this open for very long. I will be waiting for you on the other side. With that, the transmission was cut and the four Decepticons took their seats, with Shadow Striker gunning the ship directly into the vortex. Within moments, they emerged on the other side, in a heavily wooded area on what appeared to be an organic planet. However, they could also see the dark side directly in front of them, so it had to have been the right place. They brought their small ship down for a landing and the back hatch opened up, allowing the four and their vehicons to step out, and be met immediately by Starscream and Swift. The latter placed her hands on her hips as Skywarp, Thundercracker, Shadow Striker and Nitra all came their way. Well, well, look what the Techno Cat dragged in. Swift winked toward the other femmes, earning her a set of grins from them as well. Skywarp eyed the forest in revulsion. Ah, this is where the Autobots are hiding out. It's disgusting. It's no Cybertronian colony, I'll say that much. Thundercracker agreed as he broke off a tree branch. Pretty frail, too. Believe me, it's much, much worse than what's on the surface. Starscream assured before raising his arms in greeting. My brothers, and fellow Decepticons, welcome one and all. He gave a theatrical bow and an insidious grin. Feel free to make yourselves at home on the dark side. I have a feeling we'll be working with one another for quite a while. Comma dot dot. Back in space, after having cleaned up the whole mess from the attempted intrusion, Brainstorm found himself back in his office. The head of Kimia Science had been going over what he wanted to say to his ship's passengers and inhabitants for about an hour at that point, and now, thankfully, he had gotten all his thoughts put together. This would probably be the biggest address he did so far, that wasn't pre-recorded. He went over to his desk, sat down, and reached over to activate the intercom. Greetings, test subjects, scientists, and colonists, brainstorm here. As you are no doubt aware by now, not too long ago, we came under siege by an attempted Decepticon incursion. But don't worry, thanks to yours truly, my top students and my lead scientist, we were able to repel the cons back into space. He laced his fingers together as he continued. However, following this, it became apparent that we are no longer as safe as we once were. 
For the first time in over 300 stellar cycles, we found ourselves vulnerable to the Decepticon threat. He paused for a moment to let that sink in before delivering the good news. Now, before you all ask, it's not all doom and gloom. Because pretty much immediately after, we received a message from Deep Space that seems to be our salvation. He couldn't help but smile beneath his faceplate as he said these next words, Start believing whatever rumors you've heard, people, because Optimus Prime is alive, and he's sent us a message from a planet out in the middle of nowhere telling us to come and meet him there. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a pretty good deal to me, so we're turning this big lady around and we're headed right for this, Earth, place. He pointed a stern finger to the intercom as he finished his message. Now, I expect testing and other related happenings to continue on the way there, but when we arrive, be prepared to make our normal landing. Science doesn't wait for no one, people, now let's get back to work. Brainstorm, we're done here. And it's the end of Season 2 Part 8 of this what if, I hope you guys like it, don't forget to subscribe, leave a comment down below and subscribe to the channel.